we have reports. Uh oh, we're being recorded. We have reports from physicists on the ground who are doing work at the LHC. We have a section at the beginning where uh, three cutting edge physicists, graduate students, postdocs, et cetera, are going to tell us about in detail about some of the research they do on LHC, specifically CMS. And then we're going to have a tour of CMS. It's going to be a virtual tour. So we got some folks at CERN to, to sort of walk us around with a video camera. So I hope you really enjoy these, these two um, presentations we're going to show. Um, so a little bit of logistics. We still have the pigeonhole. I will not be able to see chats. None of the panelists will be able to see chats unless you, you ask questions in the Q&A. So we'll be monitoring the pigeonhole. Uh, that will be the direct link we have to answering your questions and getting them to the rest of the panelists. Um, anything else I can think of? I think that's it for logistics for today. Um, Adam, you want to introduce the speakers? Yes. <clears throat> so I'll just give a very quick introduction to each of the three speakers, and then I, I hope they say a little bit more about their uh, what they're working on, actually, their, their present research and uh, path, because they know it much better than I do. Um, so today, um, uh, actually, I'm not sure of the order, uh, but uh, we're going to hear from uh, Kari DiPetrillo, who came to Fermilab after getting her PhD at Harvard in 2019. So when she was a grad student, she worked on um, a variety of uh, physics searches looking for uh, sort of exotic long-lived particles with the CMS experiment. Um, and doing some hardware work on the muon spectrometer part of the, the, the experiment. Uh, since coming to Fermilab, she's uh, continued with some of this interesting hardware work and also um, explored uh, sort of unconventional physics uh, signals um, for, that would be from beyond the standard model of physics. We're also gonna hear from Alex Perloff who has worked, been working on CMS for a long time. I think uh, according to one thing I read since 2008, um, he's a postdoc at University of Colorado he does, I think, most of his work um, uh, in some way connected with Fermilab. Um, he got his PhD at uh, Texas A&M. He's been a postdoc at Colorado for a little while, uh, doing uh, searches for supersymmetric particles, physics beyond the standard model, and some interesting work with um, uh, high-performance computing. Uh, and we're also going to hear from Christian Herwig, who got his PhD recently uh, from University of Pennsylvania, 2019. Uh, is now a postdoc at Fermilab and um, in grad school. And I think continuing now, he's been uh, working on searches for um, supersymmetric particles beyond uh, the standard model. So uh, uh, hopefully I didn't get anything too wrong, um, but if I did, you can you can correct me. So take it away guys. Or actually, I guess Brian will, yep. will wake us up. We, we, we can't, we can't, we, this is a tradition now. We got everybody has to stand up and get ready to learn about physics. I don't know about you, but this really helps me like get prepared for the day. So let's do some stretching. Oh. Uh, for those who just rolled out of bed, hopefully this wakes you up. Let's take the first deep breath in. And let it out. So I don't know about you folks, I did some weightlifting yesterday and I'm still pretty sore about it. So I'll probably do some yoga later. Let's do another breath in. All right, let it out. And let's do the last one. Let's get ready to learn. All right, let it out. All right, let's have a seat. And I think, Christian, you're gonna tell us a bit about the LAC first, yeah? Yeah, that, that sounds great. Thanks, Brian. <clears throat> oh, so I feel sore, I don't know. Somehow I was only feel like sitting at my desk and not weightlifting yesterday, but uh, I'd like to imagine I attained the same level of soreness as you somehow from, from doing that. Um, but I feel oxygenated now, so things are good. Um, let's see. So before jumping into slides, which I guess I can actually start the sharing going now, yeah, I'll just say a tiny bit more about myself. So thanks, Adam, for the great introduction. It was uh, spot on. Um, so, so, right, so I've worked on LHC experiments basically kind of since um, starting to do a little bit of research uh, during undergrad. And so I did my PhD on CMS, and then I switched to the Atlas experiment uh, when I came to Fermilab like about a year and a half ago. Um, 
And yeah, like, like Adam mentioned, the primary focus, I guess, of what I've been doing is looking for uh, theories of physics beyond the standard model. And we'll get into what those are and what those mean a little bit as we get into more detail. Um, but I'll, I'll try to paint a picture kind of motivating some of the, some of the work that we do at the LHC and um, yeah, then things I think will come together a little bit more from there. So it, do you, do you want to, um, Alex and Carrie, do you want to say something more now or before you, um, before you talk? I can do it before I talk. Let's yeah, I think that's fine. With your, uh... Okay. Yeah. I think that, I think that makes sense. Cool. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll jump right into things here. So we have this kind of done in three different parts. So you get three different perspectives. Uh, CMS has, uh, I don't know, it's like close to 2000 physicists on it. And so having a sample size of one is really not sufficient. So we got you three, uh, hopefully decently representative people um, from CMS to talk to you a little bit about it. And we're gonna to try to focus on some different aspects of it. So. I'm going to kind of start by giving you a little bit of a review of, okay, what are the key things to know for this lecture? I know, um, you know, most of you all have been attending these lectures and heard some great talks already explaining some of the foundational concepts that set up where we're going. Um, uh, but I'll do just a couple slides of review on that and then talk a little bit more about, okay, what is the Large Hadron Collider? Why did we build it? What are the special kind of things that we're trying to uh, accomplish by this project, which has, you know, from, from start to finish, it'll be like a 50 year project, basically something like that. And so why do we make that the big uh, investment of, of time and resources and everyone into to building this, this great machine? Um, and then I'll hand it over to Carrie, who will talk in a little bit more detail about the detector itself and how we do analysis and Alex on some interesting ideas about where we're headed. So this is, this is just to kick off the review portion a little bit. We're talking about particle physics here. So we're talking about uh, fundamental physics. And fundamental is just a fancy way of saying small. What's the smallest thing? Uh, you, you probably heard people talk about Democritus and uh, atom splitting and understanding nature on a more fundamental level. Uh, and it's a nice story, but it's also, it's also true. And it's a lot of the reason why I think people get interested in physics in the first place, this ability to explain things on, on a lower level. And so, um, you can kind of trace the history of particle physics back by looking at kind of pictures like this of, you know, developing more and more precise machines that can, and, and techniques to look at uh, the world around us with finer and finer level of detail. And so by doing this, we found that of course, atoms are made of nuclei, are made of protons, are made of quarks. Um, and we have some picture now of the state of the art of what, what the fundamental particles are and how they interact with each other. That is what forces they feel. Um, and so that's kind of codified in the standard model of particle physics now, which is the state of, um, you know, our best description of the most, the most fundamental description of nature at the level that we know it right now. And um, I think you had a whole lecture kind of taking you through all the different pieces of this, because um, it, it, it looks like kind of a more complicated version of the periodic table, uh, right? Or less complicated in some ways, and that's one of its strengths actually, but uh, maybe with, words and terms you're less familiar with. Um, but at this point in standard, uh, Saturday morning physics, probably you're, you're very familiar with it. Um, and just to take you through kind of the highlights, basically it's split into uh, ma the matter particles, which are the fermions and bosons, uh, and particularly the, the gauge bosons in red uh, that correspond to the forces that, that govern how these particles interact with each other. <clears throat> and an interesting thing is that the fermions are kind of arranged in this three generation structure of basically three copies of uh, particles that are very similar to each other, except for differences in their masses. So um, up and down are the light guys that we interact with uh, every day. And then we have charm and strange and top and bottom quarks, for example, that are way heavier and are very rare. Um, and so when we think of the matter that we actually interact with, it, it's atoms, right? And so atoms are made of uh, protons and, and neutrons as mentioned earlier uh, with electrons orbiting around them. And so while the electron is a fundamental particle itself, protons and neutrons are composite particles of up and down quarks bound together by the strange force. Um, and so, you know, you'll remember there's kind of these, these weird charges, like an electron has, uh, we, an electron has a unit one of, of charge, uh, that's the convention we use. 
and it's balanced out exactly by the proton. But these quarks have fractional charges, two thirds and one thirds. And so you have to add them up in sets of two or three in order to get charges that uh, are integers and are correspond to the particles that are actually found in nature. Um, and so two ups and a down gives you a proton and one up and two downs, and that is charge plus one and one up and two downs uh, gives you a neutron that has a neutral charge, for example. And then the other thing that uh, is really easy to kind of like gloss over going through uh, this table, which just shows you here's an electron, uh, here's an up quark, is that all of these particles have a corresponding antiparticle as well. And so lots of times when uh, particle physicists talk about electrons, they actually mean, well, the electrons and things that smell like it. Uh, so an electron with spin up or an electron with spin down, an electron with opposite charge, they'll kind of interact in the same way up to some, you know, rotation. Um, so the, the, the fundamental idea is, is the same thing, but that's kind of an important thing to call out here too, that the idea of antimatter is kind of like baked into uh, the formulation of, of, this, of this whole theory. Um, and then like I mentioned, we have these heavier uh, versions, which are, um, you know, not fully understood kind of why, why the structure exists, but I think it's very well tested and, and measured at, at this point, basically, uh, in all the generations from electrons, neutrinos, um, or charged leptons, neutral leptons, which are the neutrinos, which I think you already heard a dedicated lecture about in, in the quark sector. And then uh, reviewing quick the, the force carriers. So, you know, we'll remember that there are kind of four fundamental forces that maybe you heard about in your physics class in high school, the strong force uh, and the electromagnetic force and the weak force and, and gravity. Um, and if you didn't hear about the strong force or the weak force in high school, that's okay. I didn't either. Um, but uh, the important things to, to note here is that they all kind of have a dedicated force carrier associated with them um, and multiple force carriers in, in the case of the weak force. Um, so the, the strong force is mediated by gluons, the electromagnetic force is mediated by photons. Uh, this is the light that you and I see every day and we're really good at using this for many different types of experiments. So I'm sure you've heard a lot about photons in the past. Uh, and then the weak bosons, which are uh, really, really massive. And so you never really produce them. Um, <laughs> you never really produce them in, in the laboratory unless you're at a collider uh, or unless you're Ice Cube. Uh, Ice Cube, I guess, produced a W boson uh, in a paper they, they put out like a week or so ago. So that's fun. Um, and then gravity is a big, uh, a big mystery. And I don't think I have anything more satisfying to say than that. Uh, so I won't spend any more time on that. And, and the exciting thing is that this is not only a, a theory that we can come up with and kind of uh, suss out, but we can actually go and measure all these things independently. So like I mentioned, we can produce these really heavy particles like the W and the Z in the lab. And um, the last kind of most rare and difficult to, to make one um, that we discovered was the Higgs boson, which I, I think Gally also focused on quite a bit in the standard bottle uh, lecture that you heard. And so this was discovered uh, okay, coming up on nine years ago in 2012, announced on the 4th of July uh, at CERN in a joint discovery between the Atlas and CMS experiments. Um, and probably all the people on the panel can tell you where they were when that was, when that was announced. Uh, it was a very exciting time. And so given that these are all uh, things we know about, this is our current best estimate, it's, it's by no means uh, sufficient. Um, and there's lots of open questions that we're still trying to answer. Otherwise, I don't know, maybe they just close Fermilab down and we all go home or uh, get real jobs. Uh, but luckily that's not the case. Uh, we get to keep trying to understand this in, in more and more detail and answer some of these uh, really tricky questions that we'll get into as we go. And so in order to do that, we need to do some experiments. And so there's lots of different um, ways you can set up an experiment. Um, and we're interested in measuring properties of particles. And so to do that, we need a source of particles. And so there's lots of different places you can get particles. Okay, the world is made out of particles. So the easiest um, thing to do in some sense, the thing that you can do without too much extra effort or work is just to look at the matter around you, right? My, my coffee cup is made of uh, atoms. So in principle, I can 
stare at my coffee cup and look for weird things to happen or look for things to happen that I don't understand and uh, learn something new. And so uh, there's a long history of people doing that. There's people uh, in Japan at the Kamiokanda, well, okay, now super, super Kamiokanda experiment. They basically have a big, big tank of water uh, and they have highly precise uh, instruments focused on the water in the tank. Uh, and they're just waiting for something interesting to happen in there. And so, while it sounds like kind of an easy experiment, uh, it's actually you know, the complete opposite. It's, it's really challenging, um, but it's very, very powerful because if you have something as, as simple as like a proton decaying to another particle, which we think is stable right now, we think of protons as being stable. That's why my desk doesn't evaporate out from, from underneath me, for example. It doesn't like radiate away. Um, you can look at big tanks of water basically to, to try to understand this. Uh, and so a nice benefit is that you can probe really, really rare things because you can look at huge volumes of, of matter for a long, long time, again, for, for decades. Um, but if a proton decays, you can't really say why, or it, it's hard to tell why. You don't directly um, kind of figure out the process that facilitates that. And so to do that, it can be helpful to kind of, if for example, it's a, a rare particle or a heavy particle, um, one way to access those is by making it directly, making the heavy particle. And to do that, you need a lot of energy. And I'll talk about this more in a bit on the next slide, but another source that you can get from particles or another source that you can use to investigate particles is by looking not at low energy particles that are um, you know, stuck in a tank of water or your desk, but uh, looking at the universe around us. So we know that the universe is a violent place uh, there's lots of you know, stars spitting off high energy particles, uh, you know, black holes, crazy things happening all the time that um, you know, an astronomer would be better suited or an astrophysicist to tell you about. Um, but these lead to many high energy particles and some of them impinge upon Earth's atmosphere and, and come and reach us. And so you can actually set up experiments to try to capture those and, and measure those. Um, the, the tricky thing there is because the universe prepared the initial state and not you, you don't really know what you get. And so you have to do a little bit of backtracking to figure out what particle did I start with and then what happened to it in the process that I want to kind of understand. Um, and so kind of the, the way that I set this up or Carrie has actually set this up uh, when she made this slide is colliders are kind of a nice happy medium and that you know precisely the state uh, of incoming particles that you're starting off with. The experiment is uh, very well controlled and very well defined and very, very repeatable. So you can do this many, many, many times. So at the Large Hadron Collider, for example, we collide protons together every 25 nanoseconds. So it's 40, 40 million interactions every second and uh, actually almost a factor of 100 uh, more collisions per second at that point. And because we run these machines for six months of the year or so for, for decades, you're accumulating lots and lots of interactions that you can use to understand these. Um, and because you're not just looking at water sitting in a tank, you're especially preparing these particles to have high energies um, and, and uh, you know, collide with each other in these very energetic reactions, uh, then you still have the ability to kind of produce some of these high energy particles. So not you can't go as high energy as the particles of the universe gives you, but, um, but you can head in that direction. And so uh, a picture of you know, the facility that we use that right now is a state-of-the-art place to achieve the highest energies uh, is, is the one that I'm showing you here. So this is a picture taken from, I, I think, an airplane or a, um, or a helicopter of kind of the French Swiss countryside. So France is close to you and then uh, Switzerland is uh, farther away. You can see the Alps in the background, uh, the city of Geneva, basically right nestled here on the, in the corner of the lake. And uh, for, for scale, here's an airport. You can kind of see right above LHCB, this, this runway um, that's about twice as big as the text LHCB itself. Um, and the ring, this is just a, a cartoon of the ring. Uh, the ring itself is actually underground, as you'll see in, in real life uh, shortly. Um, but this is, you know, if you projected it up to the surface and uh, you drew a thick black line on it, this is what it would look like. And so the actual circumference here is 27 kilometers, uh, which, which is crazy. Um, and so 
protons are accelerated up in a stage of uh, different uh, machines designed to bring them to higher and higher energies from, from rest until they reach this ultimate energy of 13 tera electron volts, which I'll tell you a little bit more in a minute about what that means. And then set up at um, kind of in different eighths of, of the detector are, are different extraction points, some of which lead you to different experiments. So for example, Atlas, I mentioned earlier, the experiment where I did my PhD, uh, and, and carry as well, and then uh, CMS on the opposite side of the ring. And then there's a couple of, uh, and so these are kind of the general purpose detectors that, that look for the physics that I'll talk about in a, little, in a little bit. But then there's also other interesting things you can do with a beam um, that other experiments look for. So LHCB and Alice are two of those experiments. And this, this ring actually straddles the, the border between the two countries. And so why, why build a collider? Why collide in the first place? So this kind of comes down to um, Einstein's equation, which again, you've probably seen before, e equals mc squared. Um, so if, if I set c's to one, um, then, then I recover something like that in, in momentum to zero. But when you have something moving, basically I, uh, right, Einstein's breakthrough is the idea of like a rest mass. Right? And this, this relation between uh, the, that a proton's energy, for example, comes not just from its mass, but also from its momentum as it moves through space. And so if you have two protons uh, with very large momentum, you know, in units of energy, they're factors and factors larger than the proton mass, uh, you can lead to these very high energy collisions. And so in these funny units that um, we like to use at the LHC, the proton mass is given in one giga electron volt. I'll tell you about an electron volt in a minute. And the beams of protons are collided at 6,500 times that value. And so the individual protons, uh, their energy is just dominated by this momentum term. And so when you collide two of them, uh, you only actually need a small fraction of that energy to make some of the interesting particles uh, that you might care about. So you have a six and a half plus six and a half TeV beam, and then you might try to make a Higgs boson, for example, that weighs 125 GeV. So if you just get a little bit of a fraction of that electron, uh, that uh, proton energy, then you can produce the Higgs, and and that's actually a good, a good thing, um, because, and I'll talk about this again in a minute here. But when we go to smaller and smaller uh, distances or higher and higher energies, um, it doesn't make sense to talk about protons anymore, right? We just went through the whole song and dance of telling you that the standard model uh, was explains to us that protons are made of up quarks and down quarks bound together by gluons. Um, so here's a, flaw, a plot that is effectively showing you what fraction of that proton um, exists as a, a gluon or those up and down quarks that, that make it up. So this is something called the parton distribution function. But when you collide protons together, um, the initial state is not a proton, it's one of the quarks uh, that you knock out of the proton, essentially, or a gluon that you knock out of the proton. And so one other nice thing about this um, type of experiment is that you have a couple of different possible initial states. You don't have exact control over whether you kick out a gluon in one collision or a quark in the other, but you can understand these things on average. And so um, yeah, we don't need to go into too many details of, of it, but, but that's, that's an important idea. So let's see. So I'm going to talk now a little bit more about the motivation for why we built this thing in the first place and what are some of the answer, the questions that we're trying to answer here. Um, let me see. I think people will probably speak up if there's a question or anything. It's, it's one kind of natural stopping place. But um, OK, I don't see anything yet. So. Maybe I'll, I'll just go ahead and continue and people should shout if, um, if that's not the case. So I don't see anything in the pigeonhole. So I think you're good to go. Oh, that's, that's great. That's great. Okay. I, I either need to explain things way uh, more simpler or way more at a way more advanced level, or you guys are experts, you know, you, you all are experts uh, after the previous lectures. So that, that's great. Um, unless I'm going over the head, that's not great. But uh, okay, so motivating why we build this thing in the first place. 
Um, so I, I alluded to it a little bit earlier and saw it in the first slide of trying to understand things at smaller scales requires higher energies. And so if you think about, um, one way to think about the LHC is a way to look at the, these super small energies, small distances. So you can think of it as basically a really big mi microscope. And the analogy is also like not so bad when you think about uh, these pretty pictures uh, that the, the detector produces. Um, and you'll he hear much more in detail about uh, you know how we make these pictures and where the ingredients come into it uh, from Carrie. But um, it's essentially acting as a microscope, right? Scattering particles off of each other, trying to understand their small scale structure, except instead of visible light, it has a wavelength, okay, ballpark 10 to the minus seven meters, hundreds of angstroms. Um, at LHC collisions, we're probing distances, basically 13 orders of magnitude finer than that. So we can resolve very fine features uh, in the world around us. And the relation between these two is probably something that you heard about in your quantum mechanics lecture, which is basically uh, every particle has a wavelength associated to it. Um, so particles are waves and waves are particles. And the size of that wavelength is inversely proportional to the energy of the particle. And so this is kind of the, the really precise sense in which we can relate these two things. It's not just saying, oh, high energy is small distance. There's actually this really precise way of, of thinking about it uh, given to us by quantum mechanics. And there's these special constants or the speed of light and then the Planck constant that tells us kind of the proportionality factor between these two. And so again, kind of thinking about things in different units, the proton mass seems really small when we think about it in everyday units of grams, for example. So 10 to the minus 24 grams, super, super light. A paperclip is a gram, right? Many protons. Um, but in particle physics units, it's actually uh, big-ish. So giga electron volts. So, uh, one GeV, this unit that I mentioned earlier. Um, and so to understand how big this is exactly, it's useful to think about and uh, understand what an electron volt is. So an electron volt is just the energy that an electron gains accelerating it by one volt. Okay, that, that makes sense. So if you think of a AA battery or something, it has like one and a half volt potential. So if you put an electron on one end, let it shoot across to the other end, it'll gain an electron volt. And so a giga electron volt is uh, 10 to the 12, I think, times larger than um, 10, 10 to the nine, sorry, uh, times larger, it's a billion, um, times larger than, than that, uh, which is really kind of staggering. So for example, if you did this experiment in, in real life, uh, which is probably a silly waste of batteries, uh, you'd have to stack up a lot of batteries to accelerate an electron th this high. In fact, you'd have to uh, stack up batteries that made it all the way from Fermilab to CERN, um, but going kind of the wrong way uh, around the globe in order to get there, to accelerate the electron up to, up to an energy equivalent to a proton mass. So it's really kind of a crazy amount uh, of, of energy. Um, and so if we think about that again, in terms of distance now, this is 10 to the minus 15. Um, meters. So this is, um, I think, eight orders of magnitude smaller than visible light, basically. And so if you can collide protons together, if you can marshal these, these sources to do experiments with, then you're already doing, you know, orders of magnitude better than you can with, uh, with visible light. And so what we try to do at the LHC is really kind of continue this tradition of looking at smaller and smaller and smaller scales and testing our description of nature as we go smaller and smaller. And to understand why that might be useful, we can, we can look back historically a, a little bit to see what we've learned so far. So I alluded to the, the periodic table earlier. You know, we see all these diverse different substances around us, water, glass, concrete, coffee, uh, aluminum, gasoline, and they seem totally unrelated to each other. Um, but then we realize that there's kind of this fundamental way that we can organize uh, them as being uh, composed of different elements and, and different compounds. So elements uh, that basically talk to each other or interact according to a special set of rules uh, that you know, chemists could tell you all about. Um, and it was really by um, you know, enumerating the, the possible interactions and looking at uh, this different 
kind of periodic structure and putting things and understanding the larger organizing principles that, that we can start to uh, understand those in a systematic level. And then once you have uh, this kind of table structure, of course, when, when they first came up with the table structure, there were a lot of holes in here, but then it gives you a really nice um, kind of research path of filling in the holes, understanding what happens. Um, but then of course now, we, there's still questions about it. For example, it looked really nice and descriptive maybe a hundred years ago, but now to me, this looks really complicated. Uh, there's like 118 elements-ish. Why are there so many columns? Why are there so many rows? Um, okay, we understand some of those questions, um, but does it go on forever? Is there something fundamental, a fundamental limit that you hit? Um, and at some point you kind of change the questions that you're asking uh, about, because as we look inside the elements, uh, we understand structure at a smaller scale and, and get a new set of questions to ask. And so, for example, the interesting questions to ask may now circle around the constituents of, of, of these elements. Um, so we know, for example, that um, the elements are made up of protons and neutrons. So nuclei are just collections of the two different types of particles in addition to uh, the electrons that orbit around them. And so together, all of chemistry is really just uh, explained with these kind of three ingredients, proton, a neutron, and an electron. And so three things is a, a big improvement over 120 things that we saw on the previous stage. Um, but there's still some mysteries about this structure as well. There's this really bizarre um, you know, relation between these three ingredients. We have an electron, which is super light, almost massless, and then two other particles, uh, the proton and the neutron, that are like 50,000 times heavier, 500, 200,000 times heavier, um, but are within a percent of each other in, in mass. Uh, and so if I was looking at, at this, um, even not being a physicist, okay, I see the proton mass and the neutron mass here. They, they're almost the same, but not quite. That, and much different than the, than the electron mass. That's telling me that maybe there's something relating these two particles, right? This seems like it, it can't be a coincidence. The fact that these things are almost the same, but not quite, um, tells me that maybe there's some deeper structure involved. And in fact, maybe there's kind of a, um, a symmetry at play where a, a proton and a neutron are really two different sides of the same coin. And so people made that notion very precise um, through kind of developing the theory of, of the strong interaction in, in QCD. And what we end up in the standard model in the, the table that I showed at the very beginning here was a really beautiful theory because of its simplicity. And so the idea is that this, this big table of 120 elements uh, and even these kind of two different protons and neutrons that seem like different sides of the same coin are really replaced by one thing, one simple thing. And so this is the strong force. And the idea is that uh, all you need to, to know about the strong force, if you had to you know, write down what, what we understand about QCD on a stone tablet and uh, you know, take it with you to the desert island in case you're stranded there and wanna do QCD calculations, um, it's essentially an equation. And the, all you need to know is that there, there's kind of one, one coupling constant, one thing that parametrizes the, the strength of the interaction. Okay, it's strong and not weak. And there's one number that basically says how strong it is. Um, and then also okay, what I call the interaction structure here, which is basically just the rules for what particles can interact with each other. And just from that set of rules, which is, um, it's, it's, it's basically one rule, um, not, not, not a bunch of them, and that one number, you can predict many, many, many different things. So in principle, you can calculate the proton mass, you can calculate the neutron mass, exactly. Um, you can predict new things like the, the um, there's not just a proton or a neutron, but uh, heavier states, excited versions of those states that interact with each other. Um, there's also a new particle. So if you, even if you're just looking at protons and neutrons and you figure out that the strong force exists, this now tells you that there's something called the gluon, this force carrier that you can actually go and measure. And so it was a really big deal where when people went from having protons and neutrons, uh, they saw these things called like three jet events or events with 
three energy deposits in, in the caliber emitter. So in, in your detector. So instead of just seeing quarks, you now see quarks and uh, a gluon. And this is, is proof that um, you know, the gluon is not just a, kind of a, a mathematically interesting thing to explain how forces, how the quarks communicate with each other and are bound together in the proton, but it's its own fundamental particle in its own right. And, and now we can do you know, crazy, crazy calculated, uh, crazy complex calculations, uh, really just with this one coupling and this one set of rules um, for LEC processes. So this is a, a cartoon that illustrates how um, the Higgs boson is produced at the LHC and how it decays. Um, and all the different you know, colors and different pieces are all just different manifestations of the strong interaction happening with each other. Um, and all this comes from just one, one single thing. And the weak force, I, I won't go through in the same amount of detail, but, it, but it's the same idea. You have one coupling constant, the, the, weak, the weak coupling, we call it. Um, and rules for which particles it interacts with. Um, and this predicts a really diverse set of uh, phenomena. So muons that come from cosmic rays, uh, radioactive decay and, and nuclei, um, the production of particles at colliders. Uh, so for example, at the plus C minus collider, you can make these electroweak bosons um, and the, the list goes on, muon decay. And so this is this is really great, and it's it's really nice to have a theory where um, things are very simple. You have one number or one interaction that kind of fix everything else from it. But what we can do is say, I'm still not satisfied. I still want to understand things at smaller and smaller distances. Um, you know, what's it? What's inside? What's inside a W boson? Is that a question that makes sense to ask? Um, you know. Or are there higher energy particles that, that must be at play that kind of govern the interactions of, of what we know about already? And what we find basically, and what people found you know, over 20 years ago, is that even as, as nice as this picture that we have is, uh, this periodic table, the, the modern day equivalent of the periodic table, which is a standard model, uh, the theory still breaks. And there's actually a nice calculation that you can do of basically what is the probability of a process to happen. So you can ask your favorite theorist friend to calculate, I'm gonna take two of these weak bosons and scatter them off of each other. And I'm just gonna see what happens when you do that at higher and higher energy. And so as I crank up the energy, I probe smaller and smaller distances. Then at some point my calculation pops out a probability that's greater than one. Um, that doesn't make any sense. Probabilities aren't allowed to be greater than one. And so this tells us that there's something really fundamentally sick uh, about our theory. So there's something that's missing, something that needs to be added to it. Um, so that, that's one big motivation for something new. At the same time, there was uh, another hole in the theory and that it worked really well if everything was massless. We had no way of really incorporating particle masses into the picture in a consistent way. And it turns out that these were kind of uh, solved with one common um, new addition to the standard model, which is the Higgs boson. And so the Higgs boson is this, this really strange particle. And if there's one thing to take from, from what I'm telling you, it's that the Higgs boson is really strange, fundamentally different from every other particle that we know of in the standard model. Um, so. One reason is because the Higgs field gives things mass, the interaction of the Higgs with these other particles, um, sorry, the interaction strength of the Higgs with the other particles determines the size of the masses of, of those other particles. And so because all the particles we know about essentially have different masses, there's a unique coupling of the Higgs boson to each of those other particles. So for example, the electron has a really small mass and so the coupling of the Higgs to the electron is really small, something like 10 to the minus six in dimensionless units. Whereas the top quark is really heavy. And so the coupling of the Higgs to the top quark is essentially one, really, really close. And the, the Higgs has mass itself and it gives itself uh, some of that mass. And so um, that's somewhere in, in, in the middle. Um, but all of these are a different number. And in principle, the electron could be a little heavier, it could be a little lighter. Um, and that would mean that there's a different coupling of the Higgs to that particle. And so 
this is something strange and that as opposed to QCD where we had one particle predict all these different phenomena and the weak force where we had one coupling, the weak coupling predicts all these different phenomena. For the Higgs, it's actually the other way around. We have one phenomenon, mass. And in order to explain that, we need to add a coupling, a new coupling to every single standard model particle. So this is, this is the aspect that's fundamentally different. Why, why are there so many of these couplings? And so a big part of the program at the LHC is to check that this is really the case, essentially, to say, is there really a different coupling to the, to the electron, to the top, to the Higgs? Do they scale with mass at the same time? Is this uh, the explanation for all of the particles' masses, or are there other contributions that um, are separate from, from the Higgs? Uh, so this is a big mystery because it looks so different. There's, it's really a big motivation to go out and measure all these things. Um, and then, of course, with the addition of this new particle that we only really confirmed uh, you know, eight and a half years ago, um, there's a lot of other questions that come along with it. So the one that I mentioned of why are there so many different couplings is an important one, maybe like one of the most important ones. Um, also, is there only one Higgs boson or could there be multiple? Is the Higgs boson itself a fundamental particle or could it be composed of something like, like quarks, for example, not the same quarks that we know about, but some uh, analogous set of quarks um, that make it a composite particle like a proton or a neutron. Um, does the Higgs give the neutrino mass, or is there a different explanation for the masses of the neutrinos? Neutrinos are quite strange, as you heard in the previous lecture, so um, they don't really fit too nicely in with this Higgs picture. Um, and then does the Higgs respect the rules of the road as we kind of like figure them out over the years? So for example, things like if you make an electron, you need to also make an anti-electron. You know, electronness has to be conserved. Does the Higgs respect those rules or does it play by its own? Um, and because it's so fundamentally different, there's really not a good explanation for how it should or shouldn't act. Um, and then there's other even you know, wider ranging questions like how does the Higgs potentially fit into some of the other questions in particle physics that we, that we worry about right now, like dark matter. Um, could we use the Higgs, for example, to as a portal to produce particles that may explain other phenomena like dark matter? And so really, uh, now that you know the Higgs is there, you'd really like a precision machine that can make you a lot, a lot, a lot of Higgs bosons uh, to test all of these questions. Um, and so that, that, uh, that is the main piece. And the one other thing, yeah, I think, we've, I think we have time to get one or two more slides before I hand off to Carrie. So maybe I'll, I'll say that quickly. Oh, unless there's a question, actually, should I? Um... Oh no. Okay. Yeah, I just broke up the hole, and I still don't see anything. So please keep going. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we can pause again in um, five or ten minutes. Okay. Right. So, so this, I gave you all these questions, but I didn't give you any answers. Um, so everyone has their favorite answer. Um, there's only one answer because you know nature decides what's what's correct and not physicists, but we can all um, you know, make our guesses about what's right. Um, and part of the reason is one thing that motivates me personally uh, a lot in my research uh, is going back to the same idea of <clears throat> what happens at small scales. Um, it's a common thread, this whole, whole idea. And so now that you've added the Higgs to your theory, it, it solves a lot of these questions like mass. Uh, you get some new ones, like why are there all these different couplings? Um, but there's also another interesting way in which you can ask if you examine the Higgs boson at really, really small scales, at really, really high energies, does the theory break? Keep asking the same question, what happens? Does our theory break? Do we get probabilities of both one or something like that? Um, and so I'll try to explain this carefully. So I mentioned earlier that the Higgs, interactions of the Higgs boson with other particles is the is what gives those other particles their masses. Um, in this cartoon earlier, an electron interacts with the Higgs, and because the interaction is small, because the coupling constant is small, the mass is small, but fundamentally this interaction of the electron with the particles with the Higgs gives it its mass. And so 
in order to calculate the mass of a particle, you need to ask what are the particles it interacts with, essentially. Um, and the Higgs is an important part of that contribution, the most important for these particles. And so you can ask the same thing about the mass of the Higgs boson itself. So I can try to calculate the Higgs mass. And so, like I mentioned earlier, there's lots of different kind of Feynman diagrams here that show how these interactions can go. The Higgs can interact with itself um, in, in these ways, for example, and each of these different have, diff have different contributions to the Higgs masses. Um, but like I said, the unique thing about the Higgs that makes it so fundamentally different than everything else is that it interacts with everything everything that we know so far. So in addition to the Higgs interacting with itself and that being a contribution to its mass, it also interacts with electrons, it interacts with top quarks, um, every other particle in the standard model. Um, and the size of that interaction, the size of that contribution of the mass actually corresponds to this coupling strength. So this is very strange. You can kind of run the argument in reverse. Uh, so the top quark is really heavy. So we know that it's coupling to the standard model is really big. But when we then try to use that to calculate the mass of the Higgs boson itself, that means that the top quark has a big contribution to the Higgs mass. And so what happens is you kind of get this runaway loop of two things influencing each other at the same time which leads to really big theoretical problems. So for example, if you have, uh, say that there's a new particle that explains dark matter and it's so heavy that uh, you could never produce it in a lab. It's, um, you know, I don't know, very, very, very heavy. Okay, or does the magnitude heavier? Um, that means that if it gets its mass from the Higgs mechanism, then it's coupling with the Higgs must be very, very large. But if the coupling to the Higgs is very, very large, then it should also give a big contribution to the mass of the Higgs boson itself. And so if there's a new particle, maybe a graviton, for example, that it, at the gravitational scale, like 16 orders of magnitude heavier than the Higgs, um, it should talk to the Higgs really strongly. And that should mean that it naturally gives a contribution to the mass of the Higgs that causes the Higgs mass to be really, really heavy. So if there are new particles that are heavy, it should raise the Higgs mass up to be really heavy. But we see that the Higgs is light. Um, so th that's a puzzle th th that we don't really understand. The Higgs boson should talk to everything and that should try to make it really heavy, but it appears to be very light. And in fact, if you take kind of the gravitational scale as the idea where we know there must be new physics contributing um, and say, we really think there should be new interactions with the Higgs at that scale, um, the Higgs is kind of 16 orders of magnitude lighter than you would think it should be. And so this is a real mystery. So why are these, why are these kind of quantum corrections to the Higgs mass through the heavy new particles um, not fundamentally changing the, the mass or the nature of, of the Higgs itself that we observe? And so a lot of theoretical work in the last I don't know, 20 years has gone into trying to solve this question, 30 years. Um, and one really cute idea is that basically you, you use a trick to make these contributions go away. And the trick is basically instead of one contribution, you have two contributions. So the idea behind this is called supersymmetry. This is what uh, you know, Adam mentioned I, I look at um, in, in, in my own research. And the idea is essentially that in addition to all the particles that we know about, we have kind of a new version of, a, it's not an antiparticle, but it's a supersymmetric partner. So you take all the particles that we have and you make a copy of them. And they, they don't have quite the same mass, but uh, okay, maybe it's, it's, uh, it's similar. And the idea is that these contributions now to the Higgs mass cancel each other out so the, the standard model correction goes with a plus sign and the super partner goes with a minus sign, essentially. And then uh, you have protected the Higgs mass with, 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 by adding the symmetry, essentially. Um, and so now all these uh, contributions that we were really worried about bringing the Higgs mass up to be really heavy um, are, are, 
are not there. And we have a nice theoretical explanation for why the Higgs boson should be so light. But then we have a new question, which is where are all these new particles? There should be, if there's a super, if there's a top quark, there should now be a supersymmetric partner of the top quark, for example. Um, but we haven't produced any of it, those in the lab that we found so far. So one big motivation um, is to try to look for these things. It's, a, it's one idea for why there might be new particles or one theory that might give you new particles near the Higgs mass uh, that, that you could go after now that you have LHC. And so this is one, this is one big target of the LHC experimental program. Um, another one that I'll just flash really quickly is the idea of dark matter. Again, I mentioned it earlier, but because the Higgs talks to everything and we, we have strong hints that there's dark matter out there and um, a nice reason to, to hope at least that it might be particle dark matter um, that interacts with the Higgs boson, you might look to produce a Higgs and then wait for it to decay to dark matter. Um, and so you can do that by looking at events like, like this cartoon, for example, where in your detector, the signature is very spectacular. You have a high energy jet of particles in one direction, recoiling against something, recoiling against nothing, essentially, something that's totally invisible. So if you look right down the barrel of your detector, then conservation of momentum should tell you that there should be an op opposite and equal reaction balancing out this super high energy particle jet on one side, but we see nothing. And so the idea is that maybe this could be uh, hints of the Higgs boson decaying to dark matter, for example. Now we don't have any evidence right now that this happens. There's other standard model processes that could can need to be the same thing, but you can use this type of strategy, for example, to look for something that we think of usually as an astrophysical phenomenon, dark matter in, in the laboratory with this very, nice, careful, clean, prepared environment that, that we have for ourselves. Um, and I, I think I won't go through this slide, but the, the upshot is basically that by looking out at how much dark matter there is in the universe, uh, you might have a clue of what mass the dark matter might have and what the size of the interaction between the dark matter and the standard model particles might be. Um, If the uh, interaction of the dark matter with the standard model was very efficient, then in the early universe, it would have all uh, interacted away, basically turned into standard model particles um, and, and, and vice versa. So what we can do, so the, the interesting thing here is that it gives us a target, um, which, is, which is called the WIMP miracle, basically, that says that if you have kind of thermal dark matter, there, there's good arguments to expect it to live kind of near the Higgs mass and interact with Higgs-like couplings. Uh, so there's just like supersymmetry gave us some inkling that there might be new particles around the Higgs mass. Uh, this kind of dark matter argument uh, gives you uh, the similar type of idea that the same thing uh, might be true for dark matter. So there's all these in, uh, mysteries around the Higgs and around the scale of the Higgs mass uh, that we think we might be able to understand. And to do that, we we're building this experiment or, you know, we built this experiment and this, this collider to deliver us these very, very intense high energy source of, of particles that we can use uh, to understand in all these questions. So, so with that, I think I'm gonna hand off to Carrie who's gonna talk a little bit about more how we actually use that data uh, to study these questions. But um, I guess if there are other questions, we can also break yeah. for a minute. Let's pause for a couple minutes just to give people some time to think of think of questions. There are no silly questions also. And I, uh, I realize I ran through a lot of things. Um, so if you have questions on any aspect, definitely ask them any of the standard model stuff or beyond the standard model stuff or there's a lot of weird stuff going on here that is a mystery to me. And so if it's confusing to you, it's confusing to, uh, you know, 2000 physicists on CMS also. So don't, don't be discouraged by that.
I'll, I'll, I'll ask a question uh, if no one else has one. So you talked about this stability issue with the uh, mass related to the mass of the Higgs boson. Um, is, is the mass of the Higgs boson such that uh, there could be no additional particles? Um, in other words, does the, does the fact that we've observed it at 125 GeV directly tell us anything about uh, particle content that we haven't observed directly? Yeah, good question. I mean, um, the, the, so Maybe I wish it was better. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, yeah, the, so the answer is kind of sad. So basically, I mean, if, if it's, um, so it depends on the type of, of um, new particles that you have in mind, basically. So if you have in mind new particles, like copies of top quarks, for example, um, then these are, these are pretty well. Okay, actually, let me, let me start here. So there's, there's one really cool thing, which is, so uh, there's three generations of, of fermions, right? Three different generations of quarks, up, down, charm, strange, top, bottom. And one, one big question is why three, right? And so you could imagine maybe that there's a fourth generation. Um, my understanding is that basically the observation of the Higgs boson and the measurement of this is uh, the most conclusive proof that we have against a fourth generation. And it basically totally rules that out at, at any mass. Um, and, and the reason is exactly uh, this one of the mass being proportional to the coupling strength. Uh, because basically, if you have a new quark that's, you know, way heavier than the top mass, then um, it couples with the Higgs very strongly, and it would kind of make the Higgs production cross-section blow up. Um, and so th things like that, there's, there's very strong bounds on kind of colored particles, not like particles that interact via the strong force. Uh, at the same time, there's other theories that sometimes I think that theorists have come up with just to... I don't know, burst our bubble as experimentalists or like make things super hopeless, which is like there's an idea called neutral naturalness, which is basically that you have new particles that are neutral under the standard model, don't, don't interact very strongly under the standard model. And so if you have um, kind of a top partner that um, is neutral under the standard model, then it could basically be sitting right there and you don't have a really good way of producing it. Um, and it still kind of solves this problem um, because of the gut scale interactions that, that were you when you kind of constructed the naturalness problem, this Higgs mass problem that I described. Um, but unfortunately, it's really difficult to probe at a collider because you don't have a good way of making these new particles because they only talk, they only interact with the Higgs. Um, so they're very challenging to, to produce because you, know, you can't make them from protons essentially. Um, so the answer is it depends, uh, as, as usual. Any okay. other questions? Should we go on? Yeah, it's about 10 o'clock. Do we want to take a break or go to the next talk? I think maybe let's pause here. Does that sound Five minutes here? Yeah, five minutes here. Okay. All right, everyone. Take five minutes, go get a drink, pet your dog, stand up, walk around, go outside. It's a nice day. See you in five.
Hi, right, everyone. We about ready to get started? Yeah, just one quick comment. I noticed that there's uh, today this additional Q&A button. Yeah. Uh, there were one or two questions uh, in there, but I guess maybe Alex, your answer, you have just answered uh, the last outstanding one. So mm -hmm. people should look in there if they're curious what the question was and a uh, nice response. But um, yeah, I guess, uh, should we go on? Carrie, do you wanna take it away? All right. Uh, Carrie, you're muted. There you go. Oh, no, you're still muted. Yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm bad at sharing screen and accessing Zoom uh, buttons at the same time. Um, let's see. Let me go back to full screen. Okay. And then. Okay. Can everyone see my screen now? Yeah. Great. All right. Um, so I'll, I guess we'll, we'll talk a little bit about ourselves and then go into um, our little topics. Um, so I, as an undergrad, I actually didn't do particle physics. Um, I think that's pretty uncommon in particle physics. I, um, I did my undergrad at Brown and all of my undergrad research was biophysics. Um, and when I was applying to graduate schools, I thought that's what I was going to do as well. Um, but I ended up realizing through taking more and more physics classes that I wanted to really get down to the fundamentals. And that's why I switched to particle physics. And I did my PhD at Harvard um, with the Atlas group there. And um, I spent most of my time at CERN um, working on operating the muon spectrometer, which is a piece of the Atlas detector. Um, and so this meant being involved in day-to-day -day operations. Um, during one winter break, we even installed new chambers and commissioned them and got them able to take data. And um, I think that's why I'm talking about this, how we get our data, um, because I think this, it's really important to understand how complex it is, um, these experiments. And then the other sort of portion of my PhD was doing data analysis, looking for long-lived particles. Um, so Christian sort of talked about um, a couple of very well motivated um, things that we're looking for at the LHC, uh, like dark matter or supersymmetric particles. Um, and there are many, many more, uh, you know, proposed things that we look for as physicists at the LHC, um, including long particles that I was looking for. Um, and then after I did my PhD, um, I thought, well, I spent all this time operating a detector that someone else built. So I want to learn how to build a detector. And um, the Fermilab CMS group is, is working on building uh, three different pieces of the detector right now um, for an upgrade that Alex is going to talk about in his talk. Um, and so that's why I came to Fermilab to work on the CMS experiment. And I'm still looking for these funky physics signatures, um, but did a lot of time, uh, did a lot of work um, doing like R&D for precision timing detectors. And, uh, and that's sort of the, the intro to me. And so now I'm gonna talk about how we get our data. Um, and I think the sort of goals for this section for you guys to understand is how, how complicated um, these experiments are and why we need thousands of physicists and engineers um, to build them and operate them and, and analyze the data. Um, so that's sort of really the goal here. Okay. Um, and so I'm gonna go through this um, with an example in mind. And I think the example that uh, most people talk about and is probably conceptually the easiest to, to understand and, and sort of uh, highlights all of these themes is what it takes to find a Higgs boson. Um, so this is a, a histogram, which I assume everyone knows. Um, of a prediction of um, a prediction for what we might see in our experiment. And uh, this, 
this sort of prediction and these solid histograms and the data are shown, the data points are shown in black and you can see that the prediction actually agrees with um, what's observed. And so I'm gonna talk about what it, what it takes to collect these data points. Um, and I will focus on sort of the muons in particular since that's, they're my favorite particle and that's probably my, my biggest area of expertise. Um, so Christian said, uh, we uh, used the Large Hadron Collider um, to collide protons at four points along the ring. Um, there are two general purpose experiments. So that means we can do a bunch of different kinds of analyses and study a bunch of different kinds of physics and that's ATMOS and CMS. And so that's why Christian and I both have worked on, uh, it's very easy to switch between the two. Um, and so we use the Large Hadron Collider, um, these proton-proton collisions to produce our Higgs bosons. And so then the question becomes, you've made a Higgs boson inside your ATLAS or CMS detector, what happens next? Um, and so in particle physics, there's this sort of rule, like every particle decays to lighter particles unless there's some rule that it's not allowed to decay. And um, the question is, you know, how fast does it decay? Um, what does it decay to? And how does that look in your detector? And so if you think about this question of lifetime, there are three categories of particles. <laughs> Um, so this has some standard model particles as a function of their mass and their lifetime. And you can see that there are three sort of clear categories. The first is uh, stable. So this means the particle lives long enough that you can see it directly in the detector. Um, and there are a couple of truly stable particles like the electron, the proton, our photons or neutrinos. Um, and there are some particles which live long enough that they pass through the detector completely anyway, like a muon. Um, there are particles with intermediate lifetimes, which means that they um, decay slightly displaced from the point of the proton-proton collision. And this produces um, what might be called a, like a, a secondary vertex or um, a displaced vertex. And then there are particles which decay um, so quickly you can't detect them directly. And the Higgs is an example of this. Um, so you never actually see a Higgs, you just see its decay products. Um, so it basically it decays until it's um, all stable particles that are left over and we use combinations or measurements of those stable particles to try and infer what happened or to try and um, infer that we saw a Higgs. And so this is what we see in our detector. Um, so an example of how a Higgs can decay is it can decay to two Z bosons and then each Z boson decays to a pair of leptons. Um, where this is like electrons or muons or taus and thinking about the muon channel specifically here. And um, we need to design the ATLAS and CMS detectors such that we can identify and precisely measure all of these detector stable particles. And um, so Christian, I think Christian showed this exact picture and this is, it's called an event display and it's zooming in on the, the tracking part of the ATLAS experiment. And you can see sort of these four muons um, coming out from the proton-proton interaction point. Um, and, uh, and now I'm gonna explain a little bit how these detector works. These detector works. So if you wanna measure everything, you wanna surround um, the collision point as much as possible. And the best way to do that is with sort of a cylindrical geometry. Um, we call sort of the, the this part, the barrel, and then the other part, the end caps. And this is, if you were to take the barrel and slice it down the middle and look at it, um, we have these four distinct layers. Um, the proton-proton interaction points happen in the middle here and your particles go outwards. And the first layer is called the inner detector or a tracker. And so this gives you a track for all of your charged particles. So your electrons, your muons, charged hadrons, so this means protons, um, pions and things like that. Um, and there is a magnetic field sort of surrounding the tracker and the charged particles bend in the magnetic field and the amount of bending tells you their momenta. Then the next layer, I saw there was a question. I don't know if, if uh, it seems like I should answer questions live, just uh, shout it out. And then the next layer is the electromagnetic calorimeter. So this gives you um, a shower or what looks like a shower for um, electrons and photons. And then this is followed by a hadronic calorimeter, which gives you a shower for charged hadrons and neutral hadrons. Um, and then after that, um, there should be only two types of particles which make it past the calorimeter. 
and that's a muon or a neutrino or a dark matter particle. And we have another tracking layer surrounding the calorimeter to tag and measure those muons again. And um, neutrinos or dark matter particles are the only thing which escape the detector. And we can indirectly, I see Brian has his hand raised. Oh, wow, that was quick. I didn't expect you to respond that quickly. We do have a question. It was, if the Higgs decays too fast for you to see it, how do you know what it decays to? How do you know what it decays to? Um, so in an individual collision, you actually don't know that a Higgs or that two Zs without like not via a Higgs were produced. It's only um, through these sorts of ensemble of events that you can say something statistically meaningful. Um, all you know that was produced in your detector was four muons or two electrons and two muons. And then by looking at all of those four muon events and studying their properties, you can say, uh, this set is most likely two Zs, this set is most likely a Higgs. Does that make sense? Um, so I don't, I don't see any other feedback. So I guess I think that does answer the question. Okay. Um, all right, and so then I was here. Um, and so, okay. So we, we've talked about all of the particles and how they interact with the detector, the different pieces. And so you can see that each of these signatures or each of these types of particles has um, very different signatures and it's very, or, and it's possible to identify them by looking at the signatures in each of the different pieces. And you have a measurement or in the case of a neutrino, an indirect measurement of their energy and momenta. Um, and by sort of adding up those measurements, you can try and infer what uh, produced those stable particles. Uh, okay, and, um, and this is a picture of a real detector. Uh, so this is a, a picture of a CMS, again, sliced through the barrel. Uh, and you can see the different parts labeled. So this here is the inner detector or tracker. Um, this here is the calorimeter. And this here is the solenoid or a magnet, which produces that magnetic field. Um, in CMS, the solenoid actually, it surrounds the calorimeter and in Atlas, it surrounds the inner detector. Um, different choices for different reasons. And then um, this red and uh, gray part here is the muon spectrometer. And here's a, a picture or a cartoon of me sort of for scale. I'm about like five foot four. Um, so this, this experiment is very large and Atlas is even larger. Um, so these detectors are huge. Um, and it's, and, and you'll see why that's so complicated. Um, so it's not, it's not just that it's big, it takes a lot of thought and planning um, in terms of designing a detector. So you sort of start with the physics motivations that Christian talked about. Um, and you say, these are sort of, you know, the 10 most important questions that we want to answer. Um, what detector do we need to do that at this particular energy? And so they started designing, as an example, the Atlas muon spectrometer in 1997. Um, and, um, you know, that goes from R&D to pre-production. So like building small pieces of detector and testing them to producing many pieces of the detector, installing them um, underground. Um, it takes like, I think this is 10 years um, that it takes and hundreds, maybe more of uh, people to build um, this detector. So this is 20 meters large. This is one of the end caps of the Atlas muon spectrometer. And if you think about what it takes to just install a single chamber, it's incredibly difficult. Um, so back when I was a grad student, I worked on installing 12 chambers. And if I think about what happened during, um, during that winter, one chamber going from above ground so this is being dropped through a hole in the ground all the way down to the Atlas detector. Um, bringing it, it in, Atlas is kind of like a playground. There's like these little like tunnels and chutes and, and ladders. Um, it opens up and closes and you need to bring in the chamber into the larger detector. Um, it needs to be aligned. You need to bring all of the connections. So you need to bring, usually it's a particular gas, um, high voltage to turn on the detector so it can work, low voltage to operate the electronics, um, readout cables and fibers and, and things like that. Um, so you need to bring all of those connections, you need to map them, 
Um, you need to validate it with Cosmics. And all of this assumes that nothing breaks. It still probably takes two weeks to install a single chamber. Um, and that's everything goes perfectly. Um, and so you could think if you did this one at a time, it would take many years to install something, something many, many years uh, to, to build something like the entire Atlas detector. Um, and that's why you need so many people working in, sorry, my talk is very excited right now. That's why you need um, many people to, to work on this experiment together. Um, so and a, just- a quick, quick question actually on the muon spectrometer. So an anonymous uh, attendee asked, um, how are muons trapped by the muon spectrometers? Okay, so they're not trapped by the muon spectrometer. They're, they're detected. And I'll talk about that, I think, in one of the next slides. Um, okay. And so, yeah, so this is just one of those chambers um, that takes, you know, that two, two weeks of someone's effort and time to install. And there are over 2,000 chambers in the entire you know, spectrometer. And there are also different kinds of detectors. So there's you know, you think about the calorimeter, you think about the inner detector, um, and you start to see how, how complicated this all gets. And so now here, to answer your question, is this how sort of a, a muon um, detector, how a muon chamber works? So the muon chambers that I've worked on the most, um, they were made up of something called drift tubes. And um, a single drift tube uh, gives you a position measurement for a muon. So here's a cross section of one of those tubes. You can think of it like a, a straw or something um, with a wire going through it. Um, so there's an electric field applied between the, the anode wire and the cathode tube, the outer, the outer wall. And when a muon passes through the tube, it ionizes a gas. Um, so that means electrons are kicked out of um, atoms and they're pulled towards the anode wire and that produces a signal. Um, and electronics does some shaping to this, but basically what happens is you get a, a signal um, that goes above threshold at some time and lasts um, over threshold uh, for another amount of time. And sort of when it goes above threshold, this tells you um, the radius at which the muon passed through the tube. So you don't get an X and Y measurement, but you get a radius. And then, um, all of those radii together um, are what tells you uh, sort of the track of the muon. So within a chamber, you have many layers of these tubes. Um, those drift times give you many drift, drift radii and you can see that they sort of help form a segment within a muon chamber. Then in Atlas, there are three, um, three sort of three chambers surrounding the point of collision at any point, so three stations we call them. And you then reconstruct those different segments into a muon track. And you can see that they're bending in a magnetic field as well. Um, and then you can say, okay, I had a track in my muon spectrometer, that's the MS here. And I also had a track in my inner detector and I can match those together and I, and I get what's called a combined muon. So this is the most information that you can get about the muon um, from the Atlas detector in total. And the bending in each part, um, as well as like the global fit, uh, tells you the momenta of the, the muon. And so this is sort of going from the smallest, most basic unit of our detector to the, the larger atlas detector and how we identify and, and measure those muons. Um, and not just someone, but an entire group of people um, sort of work on this reconstruction code and making it as um, efficient for reconstructing muons as possible, but also um, rejecting sort of spurious combinations of, of hits in our detector. Um, so getting a very pure sample of muons. And this is also constantly evolving, um, constantly making improvements. So then um, what you do is you select all of your events with four muons in them. Then you try and identify which pairs of muons came from Z bosons. So I don't have this written here, but basically pairs of opposite charge um, muons, so positive minus, are very likely to make a Z boson. You can also require, you can add up their momentum vectors um, and try and require that it matches up to a Z boson mass. Um, so it's 90 GeV. And then what you can do is combine the four muons um, together or the two Zs. And that should give you the Higgs mass. 
Um, and you can fill a histogram with this four muon mass. And you can see here, uh, this, this red distribution is meant to be sort of a background, the main background process. And this blue distribution or prediction is meant to be the Higgs and that's its mass peaks at 125 GeV. And so that means we've, we've found the Higgs boson. So each individual event, you, you're not sure if it's a Higgs or a Z sort of under this peak, but um, like if you look at the, old, the whole distribution, you're very sure that the Higgs boson exists and you saw it. And so all of this was already complicated, um, but there's sort of another level of complication uh, which I haven't touched on yet, um, which is that the LHC makes many collisions and it makes them very quickly. Um, so within the Large Hadron Collider ring, um, there are 3,200 bunches of protons. Um, and so this sort of, these are meant to show you what the bunches look like. And those bunches cross every 25 um, nanoseconds, which means we have four, 40 million bunch crossings or events per second. And each of those bunches of protons contains 100 billion protons. Um, so you get about 50 proton-proton collisions per bunch crossing, which translates to 2 billion collisions per second. Um, and this is just, it's so much data that we can't save it um, to tape. Like we can't, we can't store it anywhere. Um, and the other thing that's that's happening is most of these proton-proton collisions aren't actually interesting. Like we're colliding the constituents of the proton, not the proton itself. So many of these collisions are sort of like low energy stuff or junk that we don't care about. And maybe only one collision per second uh, would be a Higgs. So we're really trying to find a needle in a haystack um, and solve this big data problem. And um, there's this sort of additional challenge, which is that you have these 50 proton-proton collisions happening in a single event. And while you might have that very clear four muon signal of a Higgs, there's a lot of other stuff happening in your event and in your detector. So this is a picture of a Z to two muon event or candidate um, from 2017. This is with 65 additional pileup vertices um, or proton, proton collisions that we don't necessarily care about. And you can see how busy the inner detector is. There are so many tracks that you can, you can barely you know, visualize each individual each individual track. And, um, and while the signal of the muon is very clear out here in the outer part of the detector, in the inner detector, you probably wouldn't necessarily be able to pick out this, these two muons from, this is a very small interaction region where those proton-proton collisions happen about 10 centimeters in the Z direction. And so this sort of builds up to the trigger challenge. So um, it's a big data problem, right? Like if we were to save every LHC event, in an hour, we'd accumulate as much data as one year Facebook uploads. Um, and that's just impossible. And so in terms of what we can save, it's about 1000 events or bunch crossings per second. Um, and that means we have to select one in a million collisions and we need to do it very quickly. Um, and so if you think about this sort of event that uh, this example event, um, you can sort of see, uh, maybe get a feeling for how we would pick out the interesting events. And in Atlas and CMS, this is a two-step process. Um, so the first step, if you think about it, this event here, the clearest signature is in the muon spectrometer. Um, so we use sort of coarse muon and calorimeter information because it avoids the messy region of, of the tracks. So it's just too much data. It's too complicated, too messy. Um, and we make that, that decision with you know, limited information. We make it very quickly. And we keep about one in one, one in 400 bunch crossings. Then the second step, we have fewer events to work with. So that means we can, you know, devo devote more resources to the decision and, and use more information. And so there you use nearly the full detector um, in a region of interest around the muon spectrometer. So you just look at tracks sort of near the muon that you identified in the first step. And you have a little bit more time to make your decision. And there you're keeping about one in 100 crossings. And all of this is, you know, fairly high stakes, right? Like we invest a lot of money in these big experiments. A lot of people are working on them and depending on them for their jobs. Um, and if the trigger, so this decision-making process throws your event away, it's lost forever. Um, we, can never, um, we can never use it for data analysis. And also if something goes wrong with your detector, like if 
um, the muon chambers were accidentally off or their um, timing was out of sync or what have you, um, you can't use that data to do physics. And so Atlas or CMS um, are taking data 24 seven. Um, there's usually about eight shifters in the control room. This is a picture of the Atlas control room um, during run, run two. And there are about 30 people who are reachable by phone, 30 you know, experts 24-7 um, who can solve you know, some of these problems that could happen with the detector. And then there's larger teams of experts who are maybe not on call, but who work to maintain their detectors as part of their daily job. Um, and there are also teams of experts who work to maintain the computers, which are storing the data and doing the reconstruction. Um, and so you can already start to see you know, why we need so many people um, working on these things. And then the work doesn't even stop there. So once you take your data and it's reconstructed, you need to quantify your detector performance. Um, so if say a muon chamber was off, you need to be able to account for that in differences between your prediction and your actual data. Um, you can study the data as a function of say the number of pileup collisions happening in your event um, or as a function of time to make projections to ensure that your detectors will keep working. You, um, you need to ensure good agreement between your predictions and data. Um, so that way, when we make those histograms that we were looking at before, um, they, they'll agree or if they disagree, you know it's new physics and not a question of data quality. So here this um, is looking at the efficiency of reconstructing a muon as a function of um, sort of one of the angles in the detector. And um, you can see, you know, data is in solid and the predictions in open circles. And you can see we want these ratios of the efficiency to agree as much as possible. And so there's a whole, you know, other set of experts who are working on this sort of problem um, and making sure the data is ready for everyone to use. And then once the data is finally available for physics, um, it's not just used for this one Higgs to form muon measurement. Um, we use it to answer, you know, all of the questions that Christian was talking about. Um, and I have just some examples here. You could think about trying to measure the top quark mass or the, the rate at which top quark events are produced. You could study properties of the Ws and Z bosons. You know, what particles do they decay to? Do they decay to anything we're not, um, we're not expecting? And you can look for exotic new particles, which is sort of what I look for. Um, and I think CMS has reached about a thousand papers published. Uh, so it's a thousand analyses that some PhD student or students has worked on. And every, analysis you know together is working to answer these questions about the universe and is working on a very different you know a different question and, and only in putting those pieces of the puzzle together um, are we doing you know that really rewarding work um, to try and understand what's going on with particle physics so um, while the Higgs boson discovery got uh, got you the Nobel Prize and probably some other analysis won't do that too um, I, I still think you know each analysis is special and, and it's really cool that we can put all of that information together to try and understand what's going on with the universe. And then that's it for my part. I don't know if there are more questions about how we get our data or uh, maybe what the day-to-day -day life of uh, working on operating Atlas or CMS is like, um, but I can answer those before we move to Alex's part. Maybe not. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I don't see any in the chat, any questions in the chat, and I don't see any in the Q&A. Um, so um, the question is, are we going to wait a little bit before we get into Alex, or shall we just go straight into it? Maybe we, maybe we just go straight, because I think the, the visit is in about a half hour, right? That's true, yeah, we've got about 25 minutes. Alex, you ready to go? Yep. All right, so hopefully you can see this. Yeah. Yes. All right, awesome. So hi guys, my name is Alex Perloff. Um, yeah, let me see if I can turn my video. That'd be interesting. Uh, there we go. Um, okay, so my, like I said, my name is Alex Perloff. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I uh, got my start uh, at UCLA. Uh, and like Adam said, uh, I started on CMS pretty much right away. I, uh, so I've been uh, working on CMS since I was an undergrad um, and briefly went to a different uh, experiment at Fermilab called CDF uh, and then came back to CMS uh, for graduate school. 
and uh, did my uh, I got my PhD uh, from Texas A&M, uh, where I worked on a search for the Higgs boson, which uh, Christian and Carrie have mentioned. And uh, I also worked on uh, calibrations for the detector, which is something Carrie mentioned. And uh, now as a postdoc at the University of Colorado Boulder, I uh, look for new physics. I, I look for really exotic signatures that would be very clear um, evidence uh, that there's a new particle out there or a set of new particles. Uh, and I'm also working on upgrades for our detector, uh, which I'm about to talk about. Um, and yeah, so this whole next section is really forward looking. It's about the future of our detector and uh, for the future of high energy particle physics. So uh, I want to talk uh, about the life cycle of one of these accelerators and also the detectors, the, the things that, that we use for our experiments. Um, and, so, and what sets a limit for how long they're useful? And you can see I put this little diagram on the side. It has all these little pieces. Um, op, you, know, you, you design something, you construct it, you commission it, which means you learn a, a lot about it, you learn how to use it. And then you operate it for some period of time, and the cycle can, you know, continues, and that's how we do particle physics, or at least we, how we've done it for, you know, uh, you know, hundred years, a little over hundred years. Um, but what sets that limit? So either we have accomplished what we wanted to accomplish, we discovered everything about the universe, and we're done, which that hasn't happened yet, so um, we're not we're we're not there. Or we have used the accelerator detector complex to its limit. You know, these things are not indestructible. Uh, these are high radiation environments. At some point, uh, the pieces that we use to detect the particles become unusable. Uh, and at that point, you either need to replace that component or uh, build a whole new detector. So that's another limit. Or it's just that you are not con collecting uh, enough information at a rate that's, uh, that's sufficient to make it, you know, Makes sense. You could build a new accelerator detector that does the same thing better, cheaper, faster. Um, so all of these things sort of limit the lifetime of both the accelerator and the detector. And when this occurs, like I said, we can either upgrade the, the current machine or we can build a new one. So for the LHC uh, and then this other machine that I'm about to talk about, the HLHC, uh, we had a set of goals. So this is sort of like pre-turning on the LHC. We wanted to discover the Higgs boson. That was first and foremost. We knew we wanted to do that. That's a, a big portion of why we built this thing. Uh, then we also wanted to do searches for other new physics, right? Um, and observe rare processes in the standard model, precision measurements of the standard model. So all of these were physics goals. Uh, and we observed the Higgs boson. We didn't observe anything else, unfortunately, at that during that those early runs. Uh, we did our best to do some precise measurements and were successful to some extent. Um, and uh, but then we find ourselves in this next region where we uh, want to do searches for new physics, right? That couldn't be seen in those early runs. We want to improve measurements of the Higgs boson. So once you've discovered it, you want to measure those couplings, the uh, the strength at which interactions occur between the part of the other particles and the Higgs boson. You want to measure that ultra precisely, and then you know observe new decay modes for the Higgs boson. So we saw the Higgs decay to certain particles, and we measured those, and that's great. But uh, we know at the after that early run, we knew that there were other decay modes that we hadn't seen. So we wanted to observe those. And then you can say, okay, but once I've done all that, you know, once I've gone through all of the things that the LHC is capable of doing, how do I do more? So you build the next machine, right? And then you can do ultra precise measurements of the Higgs boson coupling. You can observe very, very rare Higgs boson decays, um, very rare processes. And then you have more data to search for new physics at really high masses. So these are sort of progressions. And we're sort of in, the, in this uh, bluish stage right now. Um, 
but we're, uh, you know, the HLHC, which um, I'll describe in a second, uh, is going to be in this far right stage. But let's talk about why do we need a new machine? So we want to collect as much data as possible in the least amount of time, because you know one answer is we're impatient and we want to do this faster. Another answer is it's cheaper. It actually is, you know, you spend a little bit more money up front, but then you can operate it for less time to get your answer, and so that tends to be cheaper. And um, the other answer is that without an improvement in how we're measuring these things in our experiments and the code we run. Uh, and how clever we can be about uh, teasing out the answer. We just need more data. Uh, and you can see this little formula off to the side uh, where the error on our measurement, how certain we are that we have a, you know, the answer we think we do, uh, is inversely proportional to the square root of the number of observations. So if we collide, you know, uh, say we collide a certain number of, of protons together and we get an answer. Well, if we want to uh, take the uncertainty and half that, we need four times as much data. So uh, if you keep doing that, if you, if you say, I want you know, one quarter of the uncertainty, you need 16 times as much data. And you can quickly see that you either need to collect data faster or uh, you need to run for much, much, much longer right, in order to get smaller error bars. And a couple of other, you know, pieces, uh, good pieces of information to know would be how, what's the probability of something happens? So let's say we want to search for Higgs decaying to uh, two Z bosons. That's pretty, um, that's pretty common, right? So that's going to, you know, ha have a certain, what we call cross action, probability of something happening, Higgs decaying to two Zs. Uh, but Higgs decaying to two muons uh, is, rarer, it's going to have a smaller cross section. Uh, so, you know, good, uh, we, we, so that's cross section, we just mean the probability of something happening. And then we also talk about the luminosity, or the rate of a collision happening, events per time per unit area. So if we want to say we want to collect x number of Higgs bosons, right, we need, and, and that occurs at a certain cross section, the, the, the probability of producing a Higgs, right, as an example, uh, then we need to collect a certain amount of information. That's what this uh, fancy L is. It's just the amount of information we've collected. And bigger is better, right? We want more data. So uh, this video is just describing the amount of information we've collected uh, in what we call run two, sort of this uh, middle component, you know, this middle run of uh, of the accelerator, and you can see uh, when the machine is turned on, you have these increasing, um, you have a slope, right? You have these uh, increasing regions of data, and then we turn it off, and it's flat for a little while, and then we turn it back on, and it goes up, and then it's flat again. So that was a shutdown, and then it goes up again, All right? So this is run two, and um, ignoring sort of the different colors, we've collected about uh, um, 147, 140, I think, uh, inverse femtobarns. So that's a unit of luminosity. And I took that whole plot, well, we took all that whole plot and we shoved it over to the left side. And so uh, this is where we were at the end of 2018. So if you can see my mouse uh, in, in 2018, uh, you had this really, this uh, blue line that was sort of at the bottom, right? And these vertical gray bars are the shutdowns. So I, I just showed you a plot of just run two. And so this is what it looked like. Uh, and then you could say, okay, I've produced some number of Higgs bosons, but I need a lot more in order to make my ultra precise measurements, right? So uh, soon uh, we will turn back on again and we'll create, uh, um, collect more data. And you can see the slope of this line in run two and the slope of the line in run three is roughly the same. And we'll collect you know, some more data. But it's not happening faster, right? So while we will have more precise measurements, they won't be, they, you know, we won't have our, our uncertainty that fast. But let's say I want to collect a lot more Higgs bosons, right? So um, five times as much. Then I need to have an accelerator 
uh, which collects information a lot faster. You can see the slope of this line uh, increased. And uh, this, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to upgrade the accelerator to produce the HLLHC. We will collide uh, more protons together, um, and we will uh, increase our the rate at which we collect information. So you can see this trigger rate at about a thousand per second uh, to uh, seven thousand five hundred per second. We will increase the amount of information that we save. Right, all of that together means that we will collect more information. So this is a little animation. It's going to be, I think it's about a, a minute long, minute and a half long, uh, which talks about this high luminosity LHC. So uh, I'll just stay silent for now. <laughs> So right now they're talking about all the different components that will be upgraded in the machine in order to produce that those higher luminosities, the, uh, the more data per unit time. So we've started, we've actually started building this thing. The lead time is really long. Um, and yeah, so that's the high luminosity LHC. It's the fun little video put out by CERN. And this is just a synopsis. So we're upgrading the accelerator chain. Uh, we'll have more powerful focusing magnets, uh, which we call optics. These crab cavities, which will, it's a little diagram down here, which will tilt the, the bunches of particles so that they have they when they cross they're maximally overlapping uh, rather than uh, just sort of going through each other at these weird angles uh, and then you know we're going to make sure that uh, the machine is well protected and that we can bend particles better and uh, yeah so we're, we're you know it's a it's a major upgrade to this whole this large accelerator And by collecting more information, remember, we can do all of the stuff we wanted to do on this right hand side, right? These ultra rare processes, these, uh, you know, more precise Higgs boson couplings. And so this is, these are, if you remember back to, to what Carrie was talking about, she showed, uh, you know, pictures like this of uh, Higgs boson measurements, right? And you had this histogram uh, of you know, this red part was us seeing the Higgs boson over this standard model background, the blue and the green. And you can see that these black points, the actual data, have these really large error bars, right? So yes, we could see the, you know, we could observe the Higgs boson, but we want to do better than that. So you have the, you know, have a little bit more data uh, in this uh, inserted box, and you can see it's a little clearer where this peak is. And then you ha we have a simulation of what these you know, red and blue peaks look like when uh, you go to the uh, end of the high luminosity LHC. And you can see that this red peak uh, from, you know, this, this red one here becomes this blue one. It is very obvious uh, where it is as opposed to uh, where it was before. 
So by collecting more information, it just becomes really obvious where those particles are and what their properties are. The other thing we wanted to do were measure the couplings. Uh, and so this is a, a measurement of the couplings on the y-axis uh, for between the Higgs boson and various particles, uh, the top, the Z, the W, and so on and so forth. And you can see we did a pretty good job measuring uh, uh, the Ws and the Zs. Um, and we had some measurements for these other particles, but we wanted to do better. So now if you then extrapolate, what could we, how good could we do uh, at the end of the HLLHC, uh, you have this plot over here. And you can see those error bars are much, much, much reduced. right? So this is the name of the game. And you can also say, OK, if they don't match exactly our prediction, maybe that's evidence for new physics. But you can only say that if you can reduce these error bars and so that you're certain that they don't match. Hey, Alex, we've got a question. Oh, yep. Uh, when do you think the high, lum the high luminosity LHC will be finished? So um, the plan was to turn on in 2026, uh, but I think that's shifted now due to COVID for till 2027. Um, so soon-ish, soon-ish in the life lifetime of a particle accelerator. <laughs> Remember what Carrie said that these things take a really long time to plan construct and then you know to run them. So uh, the HLOHC will run from like 2027 to 2030, I don't remember, it's 37, 38, something like that. Um, so they have a really long lifespan. They take pr approximately 20-ish years to plan. That's the you know even before they get constructed. Um, so yeah, so you know saying it's in 2026, 2027, it's pretty soon. It's exciting. Uh, and then this is just another example of a of a rare decay. You know, B sub s to mu mu um, is something we wanted to measure. And you can see that uh, on the right-hand plot, you have reduced error bars from the left. But unfortunately, just by saying, oh, we're going to collect a lot more data by making the HLLC doesn't mean that everything comes for free. It's not all good news. Um, so for instance, uh, we Carrie talked about pileup, the number of protons that actually collide together isn't just one. We don't just get the one event that we're looking for. We get a whole bunch of events. And she showed you that picture of uh, all those tracks coming out in the, in, um, of, the, of the, I think there were 60 some odd collisions in that plot. Uh, so this is a plot of how many simultaneous collisions there were on average uh, in, in the previous runs uh, from 2011 to 2018. Uh, and you can see there's you know somewhere between 10 and 30 10, we'll say 10 and 40 collisions uh, on average per event. And it can go as high as, as 80. But uh, for the HLLHC, uh, we'll have about 200 collisions uh, per crossing. So much, much busier events all the time. Um, and uh, so we, we you know, it, they're going to be much busier. And then the other thing that happens is your radiation dose goes up. Uh, so we need to make sure that the upgrades to the tech detector are radiation hard, meaning that they can survive during the running of the HLLHC. And one year of radiation for the HLLHC will be equivalent to all of the radiation collected uh, in the detector up through now. So the, this is a summary of all the upgrades we're going to do to the CMS detector, and Atlas is doing similar upgrades. So we're going to uh, we're upgrading our tracker. That's that innermost part of the detector. Uh, the end cap calorimeters, which are these things over here. Uh, the the muon systems and the end caps. Uh, we're going to put in a new timing layer, which is something Carrie works on. This is really 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 exciting. Uh, we can precisely time uh, the uh, when the particles hit different components of the detector and then use that to disentangle these events. Uh, and then we're upgrading our trigger system. Like I said, we're going we're gonna to save more of the information. Uh, so that's trigger and data acquisition. Uh, and then a lot of our software and computing is being upgraded in anticipation of these higher luminosities, uh, more events. 
And I always liken CMS to a big camera. Um, and if you just say, okay, what, how many sensing elements were there currently, right? There's a hundred, it's about 133 megapixel camera. Uh, for reference, you know, your iPhone is probably 12 megapixels. And after this upgrade, we're going to have 2.1, a 2.1 gigapixel camera, the, uh, which is, in, you know, it's huge, right? That's a lot of sensing elements. The other thing to take note is how fast this camera is, you know, taking a picture, right? So the iPhone, I, I, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, takes about five pictures per second. This camera, this big giant 2.1 gigapixel camera is going to take 40 million pictures per second, right? So these are really, really large numbers. Um, it's a really fun, fun project to work on. Um, yeah, so uh, upgrades are cool. <laughs> But we can't just you know, upgrade the hardware. We also need to keep in mind that uh, all the stuff is eventually saved uh, to computers, right? And uh, so the chain goes from the detector to, to some electronics you know, and racks, and then eventually software and computing, right? We save it to disk and then we need to process it. And uh, you know, I break this up broadly into software uh, disk or hard, you know, where we're going to save the data and uh, processors, CPUs. And we have a system uh, or what we call the grid, which is a system of computers spread across the globe. Uh, and you can see right in the center of that system is uh, the, what we call the tier zero or CERN, right? All of the data coming from all of the experiments is saved at CERN. And from there, you send copies to what we call the tier ones. Uh, and you can see one of the biggest tier ones is right here at Fermilab. And then we have a system of computers, uh, tier twos, and there's about 54 of them. And then tier threes are, out, are outside that, not shown in this picture. And all of this together is about 120,000 cores, right? So my computer has, uh, what is it, eight cores in it. Um, and this grid of computers, you can have 120,000 of those. And then we have petabytes and petabytes of disks. So uh, it says 75 here, but that's like just what we've collected so far, right? Fermi Fermilab can store on its own, uh, you know, hundreds of petabytes on, on disk. And then we also have hundreds of petabytes on tape. So these, this is a lot of information. When I say when I say petabytes, maybe some of you don't know exactly what that is, and so there's this is nice fun infographic, um, which I'm not going to go through in a lot of detail, uh, but basically uh, one petabyte is 13.3 uh, years of HD video. It's a lot of information, and you can see there's lots of fun little facts here. Um, these slides I think will be posted so you can. Uh, take a look back at uh, exactly how you build up a petabyte. But to give you an idea, in this, this infographic was uh, created in 2012. So when we discovered the Higgs boson, we had collected about 20 petabytes of information. And you can see compared to like YouTube collected 15 that year and Facebook collected 180 petabytes that year. Uh, so you can see where, you know, how all of these big data um, activities stack up. Uh, and then there's a ton of business emails that are sent. <laughs> but then uh, we can say, okay, well, what happened in 2016 and beyond? <laughs> so in 2016, the LHC collected 50 petabytes of raw data, and then us uh, experimentalists produced about four times that much uh, just by doing our experiments. Google stayed pretty much flat. Facebook stayed pretty much flat at 180. Um, and then you can look forward towards future um, experiments, like the square kilometer array in phase one will be about 300 petabytes per year. In 2026, when we turn on the HLLHC, we'll have about 600 petabytes of raw data. So if you look back, that's a lot more than the LHC collected before. And then you can say, OK, but what about all the, you know, how does this 200 number compare? Well, that'll become one exabyte of data, so a thousand petabytes, right? Uh, which will be equivalent to the square kilometer array um, phase two. And then the Google's Internet Archive, their you know collection of all of the websites in uh, on the internet is about 15 exabytes. 
So these are truly like mind-boggling amounts of information. Um, and yeah, so this is, you know, just another way of showing that the HLHC is going to collect a lot more information compared to what it did, what the LHC collected before. And then with all that information, our computing times are going to increase a lot. So we need to work on our software and we need to work on, you know, we need to figure out how to work, not just with CPUs, but also with GPUs and uh, things like FPGAs or tensor processing units. These are other computing devices. But we're not done after the HLOC. So let me answer that question right away. Uh, even though we're going to discover some amazing physics, we hope, um, we want to keep going after that. And so there, we're already planning, even now, for what comes after that experiment. So we have things, uh, uh, circular colliders, like the FCC, and there's a couple of different iterations of that. And you can see how, how big it is compared to the uh, LHC. And then you have you know, the CEPC, which is uh, being planned in China. You have things like the electron ion collider, which is already being built in New York. And then you have linear colliders. This is just instead of our big ring to collide things, you just accelerate things from end to end and collide them in the center. Uh, so we have CLIC, uh, Compact Linear Collider, and the ILC in Japan. And then we are also studying uh, new types of accelerators. Hopefully, you know, things like muon colliders. Muons are heavier, but they're fundamental particles like electrons. So instead of protons, which you only get a portion of their momentum colliding in the center, uh, by colliding either electrons or muons, uh, you know exactly how much momentum those particles have. Except for muons are much heavier, so you, uh, they don't lose energy quite as much. So a muon collider is a really uh, fun new technology, uh, and R&D is being done on that right now. And then also on plasma wake-field accelerators, which have the potential to accelerate particles to energies much faster. So instead of having these big, long, accelerating chains, we can shorten that up. All right, so there's an image of a muon collider. So yeah, so this is the what the uh, future of uh, accelerators looks like. Um, yeah, fun time. So if, you know, I hope some of you join us on this uh, adventure because uh, yeah, particle physics is fun. Okay. Um, I, I don't see any questions, but we're also running a bit uh, over time. So let's give all of the speakers a hand. Thanks everybody for, for chatting with us. Appreciate it. Um, I think the tour is going to start. It's, it's probably should start already. So let's give us about five minutes to hang out and sort of decompress. And then we're going to come back at around 11.09, 11.10, and uh, get started with the CMS tour. Does that work? I think so. If um, CMS, if that's OK with uh, people or CMS, I don't know if they have like a. Yes, it is. Yeah, OK. That's fine. OK, thank okay. you. All right. See you at, uh, I guess, seven minutes. See you at 11.10. OK, perfect. Yep.
All right, folks. I think we're about ready to get started on the tour. Yeah, uh, we are. We are here. Okay, we have our tour liaisons. So I'm sorry, but I don't know your names yet. <laughs> so can you introduce yourselves? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, Andres, I think we should uh, introduce oh. ourselves, especially you okay. and Grace. I, I know Andres. Uh, you last time. Hey, just come closer. You are not Wait, on the picture, I guess. So uh, just I think you Grace. also met Grace. I, yeah, I know Grace. Hey, Grace. Yeah, but I don't, I don't think, can you hear? Yeah, I can hear. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. We, we need to just, sorry, I'm not sure <laughs> how to turn it on. Yeah, there we go. Uh, that would be nice. Because yeah. of the mask. But yes, please introduce yourselves. Yes. Uh, so my name is Andres. Uh, I'm a postdoc. I work with CMS and Grace. You wanna? Hi, um, I'm Grace. I'm a PhD student, and I also work on CMS, obviously. <laughs> yeah, we're both. Uh, we work with U.S. institutions, but we're both based here. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let's go ahead. Okay. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I guess Grace and I just introduced ourselves, but I also, uh, I don't know if uh, Sultan and Noemi, you guys said hi. Uh, but hi, I'm Sultan. <laughs> let's say hi. Sultan and Noemi are um, really the people who work the hardest in making this happen. So I, I think uh, now's a good time to, you know, say thank you so much to uh, yeah, always welcome. Noemi. That's our service. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're here at CMS. We are in the, uh, I guess, 20, 25 minutes outside of Geneva, um, middle of the French countryside, let's say. Let There's not a lot around again. here. I think we have a picture that we yeah. might try to show. Uh, so it's a little quiet. It's kind of rainy yeah. today, but... Um, My computer very seems to windy. be extremely slow. Very windy, yes. Um, but yeah, um, we are based over here. We uh, yes. we kind of live in the area. Oh yeah. And you can kind of see it's it's when it's not uh, when it's nicer weather weather there's quite a view. So this is kind of the view you would have if uh, you can see the Alps in the distance and yeah that's Mont Blanc over there and you can see the Lake Geneva in the distance. Um, so it's a really nice area. Geneva is great. Uh, you can even see the Salev, which are these mountains. And what you don't see, I guess this picture sort of is taken from the Jura, mm -hmm. it's so um, yeah. which are another uh, set of mountains over here. And um, I think you guys already heard a little bit about CERN, the facility, but it's also nice to think about the geography and like where we are. So you can see Geneva in the distance, but uh, the dotted line is the border, and you can see there's, you know, Switzerland and France. And, uh, you know, I live in France, but I cross the border every day to go into work, which is kind of interesting and a little bit complicated nowadays with uh, COVID restrictions. But um, you can see that there's this big facility uh, for LHC. And uh, it's interesting. You have to drive around a little bit to get to where you want to go. It's nice. Um, okay. So I, I think we can, I'll say a few more things about the LHC and so on, but we might go ahead and sort of get started and show you around. And I can In talk- the control room probably? Yeah, well, let's maybe yeah. show you guys the control like room. Show, and... just... so I guess yeah, to give you an update of what's gonna happen room. is I'm the mobile one. So I'll walk around, you're gonna have video of where I go and where I go underground. Um, where yeah, well, Noemi and I go underground. So, yeah, we can start and go around the control room first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Grace, do you want to take over and explain what we're looking at? Yeah. yeah, why not? All right. So, right now, welcome to the control room of CMS. So, over here is where we have, or each um, during data taking, this is normally populated with a bunch of people while well, during data taking in a time that is um, not during the COVID uh, pandemic. This room is populated and all of these desks 
uh, control different parts of the experiment. So the shift leader sits here. So they're the ones that are in charge of what's happening. Uh, the DCS or the technical shifter sits over there. They're the ones that monitor overall the health of the detector and alert for any type of alarms that come from the electronics. And then over here is the sub detector control station. So each different desk here. Right now you can see the chairs are just in disarray and because things are off and people aren't here. But here each different part of the detector has experts that can sit in here and control their subsystem um, outside of the overall control of CMS if needed in order to troubleshoot and make sure the data taking the data that we're taking is the best that we can. So now we're going to leave the control room and uh, start the process of actually going underground. So you will lose us for a little bit once we go <laughs> into the elevator and have to change some stuff. So, but I can take you through the first part. So as you probably saw, when we were in the control room, Noemi and I are both wearing hard hats. We also both have steel-toed shoes on, and that's the basic of what you need to go underground. But you also need something uh, called a dosimeter, which is this here. This is what measures my personal dose that I receive every time I go underground. And this is what you need to get underground, and that's actually how you identify yourself. So you come over here, beep in, it says if you can go in and then you get your eyes scanned to make sure it follows you. Hmm. We cannot confirm your identity. It normally works. <laughs> so now you'll get to see it as Noemi actually pulls it through the interlock. So it, you have to be sure that you have the right training in order to go underground and be able to, you know, you have to pass a, a physical to make sure that you can actually have, you know, any sort of radiation exposure, which is super minimal, but just to make sure everything stays safe. And then, yeah, you come in here where we have our big elevator and you can track how far it is actually uh, underground. So you know how long you have to wait for the elevator to come up and get you. Uh, and yeah. This so maybe, the, maybe while you're, uh, j just to say a word, I don't know if, uh, you know, one of the things that might not be obvious is uh, why is all of this underground and so deep underground? And when I started getting into physics, I thought, well, it's got to be underground because there's like particle rays, there's like cosmic rays coming in and you have to protect your, you know, there's going to be noise and stuff like that. But in the case of the LHC, I mean, I, okay, I, there's, there's other examples. You can think of the Tevatron, which is not really deep underground. So it turns out that in the case of the LHC, the reason, the main reason this has to be so deep underground has to do more with the foundation, the soil. Uh, so in the Geneva area, that's where sort of the bedrock is, the solid stone, the, the ground uh, is about 100 to 150 meters underground, maybe 50 meters. Um, so that's one thing that's interesting, it's not all level, there's a bit of a tilt to the LHC, and that has to do with where the bedrock is, because we have these super heavy detectors, uh, and in the case of CMS, they still sink a little bit. Uh, so it, it, you really have to lay it on very solid foundation. Mm -hmm. So I think as Grace goes down the elevator, we might lose them. We already did. We indeed. did lose them. Yeah, they, in yes, yeah, on they, the way down, we lose them. On the way up, they, they can transmit. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's um, due to the 4G. But uh, we're, we'll get them back in a second. Um, but I, I also wanted to say a word, you know, uh, one of the interesting things to me is that this LHC complex that we use is very historic. You know, the LHC ring itself was built uh, in the 90s for the Large Electron Positron Collider, and that uh, was operation operational for, for a while. It was colliding a set of protons and protons. It was colliding electrons and anti-electrons. Um, and in a similar way, all the other uh, smaller accelerators that we still use to these days, but they, they were very historic. So some of these, like the super prot proton synchrotron, uh, they were super historic in that Nobel, prize were, Nobel prizes were won 
for uh, the discovery of the C and the W bosons. And a lot of, uh, you know, the PS, the proton synchrotron, you can see some of these guys here. Um, so there is, it, it's a little bit hard to tell, but the PS, for example, the proton synchrotron was, uh, became operational in 1959. So a lot of these date back to quite a while. I might switch over to Grace to show you, like the, they're yes. just showing you the, the shaft, the yeah. elevator shaft. Um, so they're now 97, well, about uh, 80. 80 meters underground, not quite 97, but I yeah, don't know if you want so yeah, we can say something. So we just got off the elevator at minus two. So here you can kind of see the, like like Andres just said, the big elevator shaft going underground. And you can see these big fire doors that we have to go through. And that's to make sure that all of the parts that we walk through now are pressurized. So if anything ever happens in the cavern, you can always leave the cavern. And as soon as you enter any of these hallways, you're immediately in a safe zone. So. The reason we come to minus two first is because you can actually see our counting house or our trigger room. So in here is where we have all of these racks. And this is where a lot of the decisions are made about what data we keep, what data is stored, and then all the process or the first stage of the processing of CMS data happens in here before you actually get to the detector. We're kind of walking backwards in the control and the data chain. You know, up in the control room, you actually send a command and now we're following it underground um, to see where it goes before we actually see the detector itself. So if I can say a word, you can see the wall at the end towards there, the detectors on the other side. One of the things that I always find interesting is this, this wall at the end uh, beyond the racks is I think seven meters wide. Yep, yep. And this wall separates the detector from this counting room uh, or trigger room. Again, I and, have a nice picture. And we can actually show, I yes, I think we're it. gonna share a, a picture really yeah. quick because there's two things that are interesting. This is thick enough to shield uh, from the radiation produced in the detector. Um, so let me see. So, so they are somewhere here at this moment yes. in the so-called underground service cavern. Uh, they showed the the wall. That's yeah, so the where it says pil pilier, is or that pilar French? or whatever. Pilar? Okay. I think the French is the pilier. But, uh, okay, we we speak here something uh, very very mixed language. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> just resembles the English. <laughs> and behind that, there is the underground experimental cavern where the detector is housed. Yes. So something interesting about this wall it has to be that thick. It's thick enough to protect us from radiation, but the main reason it's that thick is for structural stability of the entire underground area, which is something to think about. Uh, again, we're trying to build this on hard soil, but the, on, on the side of the detector, there are you know 14,000 tons. Uh, so it sort of uh, wants to... <laughs> sort of uh, sink down and it can sort of topple over the whole thing. So it needs to be that wide uh, to keep things stable. Yep. So uh, Grace, do you wanna show us a few of these? Okay, uh, so they are just about to go around this pillar or pilier yes. uh, in the chicane that connects the service cavern to the experimental one. Yeah, so I can give a brief, uh talk of while we're in here. So this is the part where you could also access the LHC tunnel if you wanted. So this big red door is a door that we're never supposed to open. And if you do, then that actually stops the beam. But here we can give you a little bit of a feel of you know what the actual LHC tunnel looks like, which you can see here in a picture. It's not the real one. And then here we actually show some of the technology that goes into the LHC. And I know you guys have heard about that, how you have the dipole magnets, and then the quadruple magnets are focusing. That's what's focused, that's what's shown here. And the accelerator chain, which you guys I think have seen and are in Andres' slides and a little bit clearer than the picture through here. So Grace, can you yeah. also show the hydrogen bottle? It's a, it's a little bit of an outdated picture, but a little bit behind you. This yes. is uh, a little bit to your left. Yeah, so here oh, dear. Oh, on, yeah. on the right. Yeah, this Over like, there. I got a stage fright. There we go, the, right. so <laughs> the that's... bottle. So this is LINAC2, and this is also a, a bit interesting. So LINAC2 is uh, providing the first stages of acceleration. So this H2 red bottle that you see here was 
what provided the proton source. So we stripped those protons out of this hydrogen bottle, which is not even that, a big hydrogen bottle. Well, and actually, you can calculate how much nit uh, hydrogen you need per year in order to operate the LHC. And, yes. and, and actually, that's compatible with this small bottle. Exactly. So, so, I mean, another way to say this is Avogadro's constant is insane. Yeah. Uh, but uh, nowadays, I just wanted to point out that Linac 2 is uh, being, let's say, phased out and Linac 4 is starting to become operational. So that's one of the thing, the big things coming up for Run 3 and, of course, in anticipation for the high luminosity LHC. Yep, definitely. After so many years, almost 40 years yes. of operation. In fact, I think just recently, they circulated, or or they they, uh, not circulated, but they just sent out the first beams through oh, yeah. four. Yeah. So here you can see that we've reached the second interlock. So this is the one that we have to pass in order to actually get through and go into the CMS cavern. So I'm gonna badge, and then hopefully this time I'll go through with the, my eyes getting recognized on the first try. Oh no! <laughs> I stepped on it too quick and it didn't like that. So I'm going to try again. Yeah, the sideways step. <laughs> there we go. Entering sideways. Well, yeah, well, in this, this trick is needed indeed, since uh, there are some other uh, infrared gates installed in this, uh, in this, this interlock, in this lock. So you can, so it might, you might need you might need to cheat it to to bring in the camera with yeah. the rod. Otherwise, so, so, it would it would think that that you are you are not one person. Yeah, but the whole point of yeah. this booth is to make sure that only one person's coming in, and the person who's coming in is the person who's allowed to go in. They have the right training, so it's meant to identify the person and to make sure they're not bringing in or taking out any material that they shouldn't be, and everything's accounted for. Exactly. Yeah, and in one such an installation, more... we take it very serious. Yes. Oh, sorry. One... Sorry, Grace. No, no, no. I was going to say, you said that you know those sensors will sometimes trip if you're carrying the camera. One of the things that will also trip it is if you have a ponytail. Sometimes if you have a oh, large yeah. difference between your ponytail and the back of your neck, it'll actually uh, kick you out. So that's why I have a really yeah. tight bun right now. Um, I never but... tried this. <laughs> I, I, I worked with a guy who had dreadlocks and he had the hardest time going through. And now, drum roll. Here we go. Um, Welcome to minus two in the CMS cavern. So that's not a video trick. <laughs> Oh, this is super cool. I've actually never seen it this way underground. This is our pixel platform. So you can actually work within the magnet uh, or within the vac tank or the vacuum seal of the magnet here. You can actually stand on this and work inside at a level that you can actually reach our pixel detector. Andres might be able to say more about that. Yes. Well, um, okay, I don't mean to brag, but yes, I've seen CMS in this configuration before and I've stood on that platform uh, and it's, incredibly interesting. I, I wish we could show you guys exactly what the view is like from that point. But even here right now, you can see how amazing the CMS detector. If you ask me, it's the most photogenic detector in the entire mm -hmm. LHC. But OK, uh, what you see is, I, I think, and, and Grace, you can help me out. We can try to bring together what you've seen in the pictures and the slides. Uh, this is the CMS detector, but it's like, you know, like if it were an accordion, it's uh, expanded out. And you see parts of some of uh, the components of the detector. You know, as part of the name, we have the solenoid. And it might be a little difficult to exactly point it out, but perfect. Grace is directly pointing to where the edge of the solenoid. This is like a cylinder. Um, and you see just the edge of that cylinder. Uh, and this is one of the main parts of our detector. Um, Grace, I don't know if, if perhaps it's better if you can point to stuff and identify it, maybe? Yeah, so that's the, uh, the solenoid, just like Andres said. And that kind of is the main division we think of, of like the inner part of the detector and then the outer. All of this here, uh, these are all of our muon systems. There's lots of different technology layered here, but the red is actually the iron return yoke. So that's to make sure that our magnetic field is well behaved. Um, as you guys probably know, the solenoid field, you know, changes direction inside and outside. 
And this makes sure that it's smooth all the way around. Then you have inside the magnet, what makes CMS compact is actually so Grace, all of our I... calorimeters. So yeah. just, just sorry to add a, a few more details, I don't mean to interrupt, but uh, part of the maybe impressive numbers is that CMS, as I said, is like 14,000 tons. So it's really heavy. That's part of what we mean by compact. It's like, it's very heavy for its, its weight. And it's, uh, maybe you already heard, it's like twice as heavy as the Eiffel Tower. But also interesting is that those, the iron that Grace was talking about, uh, it accounts for 12,500 of those tons of the 14,000 in total. So that is accounts for a lot of uh, the weight of the detector itself. Go ahead, Grace. Yeah, so what we said is, you know, like Atlas likes to say that it's the biggest because it's the tallest, but CMS has the most weight. So we're actually the most dense, um, which is why we're compact, even though this five-story structure doesn't look uh, super compact. But inside this volume was what I was going to say is that we actually have all of our calorimeter uh, material. <laughs> so both our electromagnetic and our hadron calorimeter. So the part of the, uh, the two that measure two different types of particles behavior. One's the particles that uh, interact electromagnetically. So your electrons and your photons. And then the hadron calorimeter measures all the quark based matter. So anything that comes within the protons, our jets and that sort of thing all so gets Grace, measured in there. Both so of uh, sorry to interrupt, but we're going to show, can we show the yes. slice just so you maybe have a better time of explaining sort of the... Okay, can they still see the picture though? Because inside there is where both of those live. And this, we're actually in between one of the edge pieces of our barrel. And then this is one of the end caps. Ah. So here you can see a different type of muon system. So you can see the uh, outer side of the CSCs, which are actually new and refurbished this year. This was one of the upgrades that's happened during the shutdown period. And then you have the uh, calorimeter nose. So you have the electromagnetic calorimeters pre-shower, and you then have the hadron calorimeter, which is actually the part of the detector that I work on. So right now, even yesterday, I actually had one of the electronics from one of these sectors in my lab and I was working on it and checking it because they told me that it didn't work when it was installed here. I took it out and I worked on it back in the lab and it was reinstalled here and uh, we're getting a few more hints, which is exciting. Yep. Um, so did, can you maybe, I don't know if you could point out the gems, which are also brand new. So the gems, so these are a, a new subsystem. It's also sort of in the cone uh, of the calorimeter that Grace mentioned. But uh, maybe I, we can take a second and show the slice. I think the problem yep. is that Grace can't see the slice. Uh, um, she can. Okay. Uh, uh, but really quickly, we can yeah. maybe show like, um, to relate this to what Grace is showing us, uh, if you were a particle that's traveling here, I mean, may maybe this is not even obvious because there's no beam pipe either. But the travel, maybe you can show us, Grace, the path of the particles as they travel. Um, so they go from, uh, let's say, from right to left. And if you were a particle, you could imagine that you encounter the collision and things sort of move from the interior of the, the detector yeah. outwards through its. Uh, yeah, but this is radially. So, yes. If, so uh, it's, it's moving exactly. radially. That's, out. that's, the, that's the, the best view. Yes. So as if the, the particles would fly out radially. Right. In so the, the, in, in the picture that we're showing, the particles travel through the page or through your mm -hmm. computer or whatever. And then they when they collide, they will move radially through the detector. And you can see the different layers here. Uh, in particular, I'm just going gonna, gonna to point out that the magnet, the solenoid that we mentioned, uh, contains or encapsulates so many subsystems. We have the all of the tracking, the pixel and silicon and the, and the tracker itself. And there's the electromagnetic and hydronic calorimeters. And then we have the solenoid. So most of the particles that are producing these collisions are stopped by the superconducting solenoid. Uh, and usually muons and well neutrinos, which we don't really directly measure, uh, they are the ones that puncture through and reach the the muon system, which is the heaviest again. And I think I think Alex was saying, you know, muons are very heavy, so they're harder to slow down. So we need all this mass uh, to actually be able to detect them. So uh, maybe Grace, we can go back to you, and you can tell us about this amazing view that you have there. <laughs> yeah. So this is a view of CMS from the top of the cavern. 
so this is one that if you actually came and did a tour in person, you wouldn't be able to see this part of the detector. So here we've come all the way to the top and you can really kind of get a feel for the breadth and the depth of CMS. And from here, you can actually see into the shaft where we lowered the individual slices of CMS and still lower anything that we really need to install underground. And that goes all the way to the surface where we just were. Yeah, so again, it's about 100 meters down. And something, again, interesting about the design of the entire detector, just it's split huh. into 15 slices. So imagine the usual example is you have a cylindrical onion. There's many layers, but you slice it into 15 individual uh, slices. And uh, as you can see, uh, CMS is able to slide or a, a, I guess I'd like to call it to accordion out these slices when we need to access different parts of the detector. So just uh, there's a quick chat, a question in the chat, uh, which actually came up in a QA and a a couple of minutes ago. Someone was asking, is the, the metal rod in the middle of just this view you're showing here, um, where the reaction happens or where the pressure is? Beam pipe? I think well, well, this is not a metal rod. The beam pipe is a tube. Yeah, but I'm not sure which metal rod they refer to. Yeah, exactly. I, uh, this is what I wanted to send back to the. Uh, so it, I don't think it's the platform to get to there. So, but maybe, maybe Grace, you can show maybe with your finger where the beam pipe would go through. And this yeah. is where the protons travel so through. At this phase of this maintenance, we don't have the beam pipe in, yeah. as this is the most expensive or very expensive yeah. material, especially in the middle. And I should say maybe just, just for a bit of context that the beam pipe is again, where the particles, the protons travel through. In the LHC, there's two separate beam pipes, but they merge into a single one for us to be able to collide the protons going in one direction and then the other direction. And then a really quick thing is that we talked about all these upgrades going on for the high luminosity LHC. So mm -hmm. one of the things that's to me very interesting is that the next generation pixel detector that's not gonna get installed for a couple of years, it's, it's gonna be so close to the collisions that we need to replace the beam pipe with one of a smaller diameter. So that's being replaced now in anticipation for that next generation uh, pixel detector that's going to be exactly. installed the, later. I think the, the closest layer of the pixel is going to be not more than two millimeters away from the beam pipe. Just give, I know just, because yeah. my fibers need to be in between. <laughs> so just to give you an idea, it, it, we get, we're trying to get as close as two millimeters. And uh, maybe that was mentioned, but just to give you a uh, order of magnitude idea of what the beams are doing when we collide them, we usually say they're, they get, we get them to about the width of a human hair when they actually collide. Grace, you wanna say any, any other? Yeah, so here we've traveled to the other end of the detector. And here you can see that this actually a mirror version of the side that we just saw. And you can really get a feel of the symmetry of CMS and how when we say we close the detector, these pieces come together like an accordion and actually create a hermetic uh, feel. So we can actually measure in 360 degrees all of the interactions that come from the detector. Here you can get a feel of what it actually looks like to do this work. So that platform that we saw on the other side, there's another one that exists on this side, but it's in the process of being built. So generally we can't work on both sides at the same time. Well, also the people that the experts that have to be on both sides at the same time, so that doesn't work. But you always can prepare one side and have people working on the other on different projects. And here you can see the different elevated platforms that we actually use to be able to work at these heights. You can see a cherry picker and a scissor lift and uh, what is it? Ah, a forklift. Oh my goodness, I should be able to identify that from here. But you can see the, the big construction equipment that we actually use in order to be able to reach these and actually interact with the detector since it's when it's in this state. If you wanted to work inside the, the vac tank, if you didn't have the pixel platform, say you wanted to work fully in the 360 degrees of inside the solenoid, like if you do uh, calorimeter work, we actually have this big yellow cage that slides in and allows you to climb around inside in 360 degrees in order to work on all the different parts. So Grace and here you can has see some first-hand experience. Uh, yeah. yeah, Grace can tell you all about that because she has first-hand experience working in the back tank and she's got some really cool pictures of that too. 
yeah, that's what I know the most about. So that's what I, I tend to focus on. But, uh, but yeah, this gives you a good feel of the size and scope and what it actually means to do this type of work. It's really close to construction, actually, which I enjoy. <laughs> Yeah, there's many things about this that even like civil engineering, when I, I mentioned, uh, you know, there's history here and we had this tunnel uh, built before, but this facility was completely built uh, for DLHC and even just digging through the earth to build the shaft, you know, uh, remove all the, all the dirt, there was like running water. So we had to freeze the water I think there is an underground river. Here. It's like an underground river. So they had to like freeze with liquid nitrogen, the running water through the ground to be able to dig through. And just thinking of the tolerances, like, you know, the shaft is only so big and some of these components are so heavy. Uh, just thinking of all that is, is really, really interesting. And you can find videos. There's, there's a lot more detail you can find. So uh, Grace, you wanna talk about the I guess they're at you know, on top of CMS right now, which is awesome. <laughs> yeah, we're as far on top of CMS as you can possibly get. Here you can see the one of the cranes that we use, and you can actually see our fire system. So these are foam blowers. So if there's ever a problem underground, that's how we actually put out the fires instead of water in order to protect electronics. This is just the last resort indeed. So yeah. <laughs> the foam part is only at the end. Grace, are they? Still... Yes. Okay. Okay. You are still there. Okay. I'm still there. I, I mute because I don't know how much feedback you guys get because it is really loud with all the stuff underground. So when we're talking, I'm not sure how much comes through. Well, we so can actually hear you really well. Yeah, these headsets okay. are very really fine. <laughs> So it looks like we got a question for you guys. One, the question is, it's from Mayuk Benerji. How wide is the entire tunnel? The tunnel itself. So the LHC? Is, the LHC tunnel itself is 3.5 meters diameter. This is something like, I think, the Victoria Line in London, the, where, where, where so, these very small cars are. But we're, we're talking about the beam tubes or the beam pipes. Is that correct? The diameter of the beam pipes? I'm not sure if they mean the uh, diameter of the OHC. The, 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 the tunnel is 3.5 meter. The, the diameter of the of the tubes is something like uh, it 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 changes. It varies quite a lot, but never, I think it is not bigger than 10 centimeters, and not smaller than yeah. four centimeters in diameter. So if you're talking about the tubes that contains the protons as they whiz by, uh, as Sultan said, these there's two of them usually around most of the ring and they're about 10 centimeters usually. And these are of course kept in a vacuum or close to as close to a vacuum as we can. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess more of a vacuum than outer space, um, I believe in some part. Well, it is something like the, the dark side of the moon. Okay, I see. <laughs> um, and uh, one more kind of sense of scale because here you can see it. The detector itself is 15 meters in diameter, which would make the cavern, you know, roughly 20 or 22 meters when you count the uh, the walkways that we have on the sides that you just saw. Well, that's why we are compact yes. with respect to the Atlas. Which well, is, uh, uh, another, you know, I, you can think of compact, but I, I think about it as being just everything in the detector is filled up with sensors and with detectors. There's no, you, you look at other detectors like Atlas, for example, as Grace mentioned, it's really big, but there's just gaps uh, where there's basically nothing. Uh, you look at other detector like LXCB and you're, you're like, where's the detector? It's like, you can barely see it. Uh, so CMS is very spectacular in that way. Uh, when it's all put together, it's just a solid unit filled with like custom built state of the art detectors. And again, we're improving these all the time and trying to upgrade them as we go. So at the upgrade, if you want to install a new part, anything there, you have to fight for each cubic centimeter. It's, it's, yes. I'm not kidding. I, I've just seen in, in one of the, the presentations before, uh, nice high voltage connectors on the muon system of the Atlas. 
I saw a couple of them for the same chamber. We cannot afford it. We, they are yes. too big. So uh, <laughs> real estate is, is prime, you know, in, in CMS. Yeah. And it, it, it really to give you a sense of this, like we really have to rehearse or very carefully design where everything will have to go in, in terms yeah. of infrastructure, just the power cables, the cooling pipes, the, even fiber optics, everything has to be carefully, carefully routed and uh, planned before we even get even close to, to installing things. And that applies in general, like when we talk about these upgrades, you, you wouldn't believe how much uh, planning goes and how much testing goes into installing something, something in CMS. Uh, and maybe to give you a, not to exaggerate, right, but a lot of the components that you see right now in the CMS detector were designed 20, 25 years ago. And just the cycle of how long it takes to propose uh, a design and get funding and get you know tests done and proof that the technology is sound and reliable to actually installing the thing, it could be a decade. And uh, so that's also what we're constantly pushing to improve our detector because what you see is in a sense outdated. It's still state of the art, but uh, we are still currently you know, always pushing to make it even better. I have a direct example. I work for the, the hardware muon barrel alignment system where we use very simple analog uh, uh, CMOS cameras. This specific model we use, the production of this was stopped in 2003. But since this is the tested model in radiation, in magnetic field, whatever, we, we have to use it. For example, in the in the, the phase two upgrade, we plan to make a project to to get something uh, a, a, a newer model on, and in this, but this is not an easy thing. Yes, it, it just takes it. You really have to make sure everything you put in the detector is absolutely going to be reliable for years and years. Uh, so I think okay. like Noemi and Gracie want to take over. Yeah, we would like to show something here. So we're on the floor of the cavern now. And here you can see what it looks like to actually, if you were gonna come all the way down and work, this is kind of where you would be. And here you can see one of the uh, air feet or the hydraulic feet that actually hold up CMS. And it's one of the ways that we can actually move, uh, the, move the material around. But what we're about to show you is like Andres and Sultan were just saying, you know, this thing has lived a long time and will live a lot longer. And when you expose metal to magnetic fields for a long amount of time, sometimes that field sticks and we're going to show you uh, that here in these feet there's actually some magnetic field that still remains so she just has normal paper clips and to be clear and here this you is, can see this is sort of a that, residual magnetic field mm -hmm. and this yep. you have to imagine normally this is exposed to four 3.8 tesla which is about a hundred thousand times stronger than the earth's magnetic field mm -hmm. but even now the magnetic field has been trained into this piece of iron, and you can actually see that the paper clips still stick. So there's always Indeed. magnetic field in the cavern. It's something yeah. to take into account, like even, uh, for example, like if people want to access the detector, we have to make sure that it's safe. You know, if, for example, when we had the open days a couple of years ago, we had to check whether people with pacemakers, whether it was safe for them. And I think there were areas that were, uh, you know, that residual magnetic field was still large enough to be dangerous for some people. So this is a really, really cool view. You're, you're getting to see under the detector and Grace is like just walking under all of this, uh, all of these detectors and you can see power cables. Uh, there's all sorts of I, I just I just imagine that the, the uh, cable management, you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, actually, this is very hard. This is very hard to follow. We have uh, uh, a dedicated group. So if you were to come and do this tour, you know, like a month or two ago, actually, this would be in a bunch of different pieces. You could see the sheath around our solenoid as this was pulled out more like uh, slices, but now it's all been closed because we're starting to prepare for beam, even though beam is still several months away. Yeah, and maybe just to give you, I know uh, the schedule was already talked about, but we're 
uh, to us, I mean, and me especially, I'm working on some of the detectors that are going to be installed for this next run, uh, run three, as we call it. We are rushing to get everything done because in a few months, we're going to start installing the most, most interior parts of the detector. Uh, I think you already saw that there's this pixel detector, which is closest to the interactions that goes in first. And then we sort of build around that. Although, as you can, I'm sure you can tell, there's some detectors that are still there. The tracker is still installed, mm -hmm. but the, let's say the heart of the detector, the inner, innermost parts are being uh, installed or reinstalled uh, in the next couple of months. Yep. Uh, we got a question. Is there a, a specific reason why everything has different colors or is it mostly just cosmetic? Well, actually, we do have a reason for having different colors. Uh, the red color cables are always high voltage. The, the blue one is for muon system, muon uh, 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 data cables. I think the green is tracker. I'm not aware, actually. Uh, uh, yeah, I, actually, I'm a muon guy, so I, I know the blue, but I don't know the other. Hk yellow. Hk yellow. Uh, um, Ika probably white. So there are there are different colors for different sub detectors in order to be able to immediately realize what you are cut through. Um, but in terms of the detector itself, I don't think they're like. Why is the iron yolk? Red. Why is red? This was this was a this was just a choice. So just we to are make it look the nicer. <laughs> dominant color of CMS is red, while the dominant color of the atlas is blue. Actually, this is very very nice. Actually, there are there are some some artistic approaches as well. So. Do the electronics get damaged by the magnetic field of the residual ones? No. The the electronics must be tested. Everything that gets in must be tested. Even, even we can talk about the tools that you're allowed to bring down there. Maybe Grace knows a lot about the kind of tools you can bring down. Well, if we if we turn on the magnet, you cannot bring in the steel tools. Yes. So that's one yeah, thing. That's... We're, we're always supposed to bring down non-magnetic magnetic tools, because even though when it's off, it should be safe. You never want to forget anything. And then once you ramp up the four Tesla magnet, end up slinging a, a screwdriver oh, that someone yeah. felt but left even, through the thing. Even when you put a detector together, you have to use non-magnetic hardware. Uh, but even, I mean, I think when you talk about the incredible feat of engineering that is the CMS solenoid, it it is trying to tear itself apart in a way. It's, it just generates these such incredible magnetic fields that just the stresses that are generated are very, very impressive. Mm -hmm. So just the engineering that goes behind designing all these things. I mean, we, we I think, I, I guess most of the talks you heard today were about the physics and I'm a physicist, Grace is a physicist, but I still really appreciate all the effort that's gone and all the engineers and technicians especially that make this happen you really have to just appreciate how how amazing all this is the fact that this is all works so well you know exactly exactly this is this is a very unusual design i would say um, and completely custom there's nothing like it that's exactly exactly uh, about the atlas, probably. Um, <laughs> well, yes, outside of physics. Yeah, but, say, but but uh, these these are really really uh, special things. What you can you can imagine that the nose you saw on the the ANTCAP detector that moves in due to the magnetic field something like fifteen millimeters, even though it is sitting on a sixty centimeter thick iron <laughs> disc. <laughs> So just one thing to follow up on a conversation that we had just had about like what can you take into the cavern and how can you take things into the cavern before on the when we showed the first interlock or the, I guess the second interlock to enter into the cavern, it didn't have a bigger space, but here we have something this blue door can actually open. So you can scan larger amounts of things in and out if you need to. So say if you're going to install things underground, you'd put them in here and they would 
that would allows you to not have to walk them through the uh, through the tiny interlock, but this is how you can get larger stuff out that doesn't necessarily need the crane to be lowered in. Yeah, and again, there's many requirements for when you do this sort of thing, especially um, when let's say the detector is running, that we have collisions and then we have maybe two weeks where we can do some work. There's an unbelievable amount of uh, just accounting of what material goes in, goes out of yep. the detector, how it's handled, what people have access, how they have access, how much time they're spending there, when they're spending or like where they're spending that time, what kind of uh, you know environment they're under, how much uh, exposure they have, uh, what dangers you know. One of the Grace talked a little bit about the trainings that we have to take safety trainings, but there's even like, there are gases that we use that can displace oxygen. So even things like uh, learning how to use an oxygen mask, essentially, if we, if there's like less oxygen in the air or a dangerous level amount of oxygen, you have to be able to, to use those. So there's many, many things. I guess that's, that's one of my main points is that anything you might not even consider, uh, have to take trainings for, we have to understand, we have to know how to deal with anything like that. We got uh, another question. How closely do the engineers work with the physicists and what might an interaction like, like, like that look like? So well, whatever I, I, you've seen, you wanna... oh, sorry. So yeah. whatever you've seen is uh, driven by physics, at least how it should look like. But the design, the actual design, how it should be built is done by the engineers, not the physicists. Yeah, and, and this can take many. I mean, I, I work with electrical engineers exactly. who have to design the boards, for example, the power supplies. Uh, but there's also mechanical engineers that have to deal with the actual. We talked about all these cables that have to fit and they have to do this and do that. And I have a lot of I've had a lot of close interactions with a mechanical engineer because we just, for example, we switched the way we deal with the fiber optics in our detector and i was like well let's do this instead that's going to be simpler but that was you know almost a month of working with our mechanical engineer to make sure that physically this thing would work and uh, would fit mm -hmm. and the tolerance is because this is one of the big things the tolerance uh, our detector is like very inwards in the detector it's close to the pixel detector so everything is even more it's even tighter Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the sort of interaction you might have. You, I, I've worked where, directly with engineers and say, we kind of want to, we would love to be able to do this. And then, then they do the best they can in yeah. order to, yeah. to accomplish that. So normally in, in the real world, we, we speak different languages. Uh, what concerns the engineer and the physicist. But here we have to learn each other's. So the boundaries somehow disappear in between us, we, we, are, we are doing a little bit of engineering work, uh, work and they have to understand the... Yeah. And this is also something that's important to understand is like uh, you train or you study physics and you do have to learn about, you know, electronics, for example, because you, you do have to communicate with the engineers who, and let's be honest, they know a lot more than, than I do, at least personally. Um, but you need to be able to say, this is our requirements. This is what our detector needs to be able to do. Um, so there has to be that, you know, communication and we need to be able to accomplish the, these things together. Yep. I think we might be getting close to the end, but we can take questions, I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was, I was about to mention that. So the 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 session usually ends at around 12 our time which i think is about six or seven your time um so if you are still around feel free to dismiss yourself and go off and you know enjoy the rest of your weekend but if you have any questions you know please ask them uh for many of you this will be you know a rare occasion that had to talk with scientists who are directly working at the lec on the cms um so feel free to spend as much time as you can. Oh yeah, we forgot to give you guys a hand. Thank you. Thank you for, thanks for showing us around. We really thanks appreciate again it. to Zoltan and Noemi. Yeah. Noemi, Zoltan, Andreas, Grace, we really appreciate it. And we thanks are pleased to, the to be here. Thanks to Alex. Uh, thanks to everyone.
Um, so yeah, now is the time to ask any burning questions. If not, I think we're gonna let everybody get off, get on with their weekend. Let's see. So we don't have any open ones yet. I think we've we've done a really good job of answering the ones that came up. Let me check the pigeonhole. Um, as soon as I can find the chat. Oh, there it is. I don't see any, I don't see anything in the pigeonhole. Let's check the chat. Oh, there we go. We got a couple. Uh, how much of the accelerators can you salvage for future projects? Do you want to? I don't know, Sultan. Maybe you have a bit of experience with uh, sort of reusing older components. So at CERN, there is a custom that the the equipment that are that are phased out stored somehow for for the future. In case of the 1,232 dipoles, I'm, I'm a little bit worried that we will store all of them. Um, but uh, indeed, there are some experiments that use uh, uh, LHC dipoles, so very probably a couple of them will be saved. But this question is uh, uh, will, will emerge only after 2035 or even, even beyond. Yeah. So, but, but there's even... Uh, I, I maybe, I don't know, I don't mean to call out, but Alex, for example, who's worked on the, I don't know if you worked on the Tevatron actually, but the Tevatron is an example, like in, in Fermilab or at Fermilab, we had the Tevatron and it was phased out. CDF was completely taken apart. And I don't exactly know the setup of D0, but I think it was also taken apart. In, no, know, D0 is still there. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't CDF was a lot of the components from CDF were sort of reused. I think I don't, I'm not quite sure. Um, uh, yeah, some of them. I think mostly it was taken up, just taken apart to make space for the new, um, well, not so new now, the Illinois Accelerator Research Center. Yep, very probably the, on contrary to the accelerator parts, detector parts will not reserved or except some pieces of the calorimeter on the desktop right. well, here there. Mm -hmm. I can also say uh, I can yeah. also say a quick word because I recently I ran into the opal uh, strip pixel uh, I had detector. one for many years on my desktop. Uh, so yeah. this is this yeah, is now so on display. <laughs> exactly. So I think oh, yeah. the picture I took, isn't it Alex? Uh, I don't know if it's the one you took or I found it online, but it was a really good picture I'm, and I've I'm like it. Really I'm like 90% sure I took that photo. <laughs> That's uh, awesome. Yeah. So this this is a picture of the Opal inner strip tracker, and it's now on display at CERN in the like at the CERN Bond Lab, uh, in a less maybe more tragic uh, way. The Opal. This is like an old detector that was operational in the LEP days, the Large Electron Positron Collider. It the uh, central detector, I think, I think it's what it's called. It's like a wire chamber. It's sitting outside the ISR and just, yeah. uh, there's actually, I found, I, I showed this to David, you, there's like an old, or actually a recent video and they're like, this broke in like 1991 and we saw some problem and we kind of try to get around it, but it was really broken and we never got a chance to troubleshoot it or, or really figure out what was wrong. And they took out the log which was a notebook and they're like at this date you can see that there's a problem with the high voltage and then they went in in this like really old detector with flashlights and they're like look you can see like a dark spot here that's probably where the problem happened yeah i saw this so, movie that's 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 really interesting yeah actually this is a real post-mortem study yeah <laughs> but to to i guess the, to summarize sometimes some components you can reuse but some of these, like the technology moves on, right? So you, you really want to use the most cutting edge technology. So it's not, it's not always feasible to reuse the things. But again, even in CDF, they, they had the uh, inner tract or inner detector was on display for a while when it was upgraded to CDF2. So sometimes it's just uh, displays like uh, the uh, graveyard as we call it here at CERN has uh, older detectors that are just on display, which is also very cool. And cool. In, it, actually at, at Fermilab, uh, hopefully when you guys get to come in person, um, we have a CMS silicon sensor or, or part of the tracker um, 
right next to CDF, next to D0. Um, and hopefully we'll get another one, we're hoping. So um, that's awesome. Yeah, you can see all the different technologies it progresses or you know, at the same stages and the different detectors. So, so what I find, at least for some of the experiments that I've been on, is that we tend to salvage a lot of the bigger experiment pieces of the bigger experiments for use in our smaller stuff. So I did my thesis on an experiment called Sequest. And literally all of Sequest was um, pieces of experiments that were salvaged from older, more expensive things. And turns out you can get things done pretty quickly, yeah. um, I'm sorry, not quickly, cheaply, by using things that you know people spend a lot more money on. <laughs> so another good example, not to keep going on about this, but G minus mm two -hmm. was uh, shipped over from uh, Brookhaven, I think. And this is like an old, uh, I don't even exactly know the details, but this was, uh, sail, they sailed the, the main component, for the, I think the solenoid, I'm not even sure. They sailed it down the coast and up through the Mississippi to take it to Fermilab. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, on April 7th, I think they're gonna publish their first results. So keep an eye out mm -hmm. for that. Um, all right, we spent a lot of time on this question. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry? So do we have any more? Yeah, we have a few Yeah, more. yeah, there are, there are some more questions yeah, concerning sorry, sorry. what is our favorite specific duty at CERN. I think Great. we all have, yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, my favorite duty is um, I work a lot with the Hadron Calorimeter Electronics. So my favorite thing is working on those but then when i get to see that they like actually going underground and installing those when i take them from their individual parts put them together have their unit then they go underground like watching that whole progression of when i get to be hands-on in the beginning and then now when they're actually just taking data that's my favorite part of seeing how the piece of cms that i built actually starts getting used in data and being able to be a part of each one of those steps overall that process is what i like the most mm -hmm. so indeed uh, uh that was a second part of this question. So uh, the favorite department, data holding, uh, compartments, accelerators, etc. So we are we are detector physicists. Yeah. So we 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 are mainly devoted or absolutely devoted to the CMS experiment hardware. Yeah. But of course we 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 love to learn about the others as well. I do, but I can't <laughs> say that I prefer the LHC to CMS. Yeah, yeah exactly. My, my yeah. So yeah, yeah, we CMS. we all have. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We all have bindings. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're contractually obligated to say that. <laughs> <laughs> and also, how much maintenance does the accelerator require on a daily basis? Wow. Well, we could oh, talk about that for well, half an hour. At least. I have like three emails that I already have to maintain something like right now. So yeah. the, you know? the, the short answer is a whole lot. Uh, and we can we can discuss at length, but a lot. I just a uh, too much to even go into detail, I think. Every day there's something that someone needs to do. You well, need to constant, that's why we have the control room here is so yeah. people are always here, always watching it. And what cap what saves us is that there's different levels of problem, right? Lots of stuff, just the shifters here, they may not be experts in every single sub detector of CMS, but there's a lot that they can do to make sure that things are working and that things can go forward. And then if that, if they can't solve it, then they call the next level expert and the next level expert yeah. inevitably it's in the middle of the night. So um, I, I, I kind of started to say like, oh, it's incredible that this all works together and it works so well, but it's not just, it, it doesn't just work by itself. It requires thousands, literally thousands of people to support the experiment and maintain the experiment and upgrade the experiment and study. And like, even down to like the tiniest details, like, you know, when we actually analyze the data, we have to simulate the detector, all the things that are in there, where they are, how do the particles that collide, how do they interact with the detector? We have to really carefully predict or simulate how that happens and compare that to what we actually measure. So just that amount of incredible detail uh, just highlights how much work has to go into this and how many people are involved. It's really hard to, you know, to understate how much work it is to maintain this. <laughs> yeah, but that doesn't mean that it'll like, it's always one step away from breaking. That's not true. Either. No, yeah, Most of, of the stuff, it's always refining it, making sure that everything behaves exactly the way we want it. And we demand a lot from the detector. Like, yeah, it might and be we, working, uh, and we, we want always better. want it to work better, <laughs> Yeah, right? So that's one of the main things. It's not that it's broken or about to break, or sometimes like, <laughs> uh, okay, but, uh, 
but, but the thing is, we want it to work better, right? We want it. We want better resolution. We want, uh, you know, more data, of course. We want the run to start faster. We want yeah. the HCAL to configure faster. Like everything, you can always make it better. Yes. Yeah. And this is not an ordinary work, I guess. So what we are doing here is rather a lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we're here on a Saturday at. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's just noon there. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> Okay. Uh, here's the last question. How much maintenance does accelerator does the accelerator require on a daily basis? Well, I don't know how much the accelerator needs. Yeah, yeah the, the LHC, but, but the LHC is also like its own. Uh, we're we're not experts. We uh, see it work perfectly, but it's probably mm, similar to wow. what we. I mean, <laughs> even when they're start. injecting, we're like, oh, they dumped the beam again. So, uh, so, so once they are running, they cannot go in. Yeah, but of course they have they have background researches in the labs, so definitely they they but spend the the day. Uh, the maintenance for the accelerator we have dedicated maintenance periods. Every six week we have three days, even when we are in a run phase. Every year end we have uh, about two months, and we have these long shutdowns as we call them like the one that we are in, which uh, goes from one year, two year, three years. Uh, this one, this LS2, as we call, uh, was designed for two years. Uh, now we are in the third year because of the, the COVID, but indeed, uh, this was not uh, designed for a long one. However, the next one, when we will make the uh, the changes from phase one to phase two. The high luminosity. Exactly. This will this will take three years. This is significant upgrades. And this is driven by the by mainly by the accelerator. And and just to emphasize two things, like uh, again, you have to take into account that we are sort of piggybacking on very old historic detectors. The PS, for example, is still going to be in use, and that was like uh, commissioned in 1959 or so. So these are really old detectors that do require some maintenance. The PS, for example, can break sometimes, and that's a problem, but it's an old detector. And uh, there's just always the, you know, unexpected, you know, we've had two occasions where a weasel or a stone martine or something has uh, chewed through some tr transistors or something and taken down the LHC. So that, that sort of thing, which is that was unexpected. The, that was a, the, one of the, the large power converters, uh, some multi-megawatt power converters. Where this uh, some fortunate creature just shorted. Yeah, those things yeah, have to be really sad, tasty, yeah. right? I mean, well, they, they, twice. They, they tend to they tend to 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 love these places. Um, but actually, uh, CERN made an upgrade there, so they cannot reach those places the anymore. Upgrade. Exactly. <laughs> Very important. Well, upgrade. well, actually, we are just. We are just just uh, well. I, I I wouldn't laugh on that, but but we are we are just just taking it uh, uh, at this pitch. But uh, that was a major blackout that was CERN, bad. so we lost everything. <laughs> it's pretty remarkable, just a little tiny weasel, curious weasel, and... <sighs> butterfly. Happened, happened <laughs> so no, again, yeah, just the unexpected things. Yeah, exactly, happen. exactly. But this is this is this is a big. Big, uh, place in the fall, fall. All right, folks, I think we're about half of the attendees and we're about 15 minutes over. Uh, I don't see any additional questions right now, so I think we're going to call it a day. Thank you so much for guiding us through CMS again. We really appreciate it. Let's give everybody a hand. Yeah, thank Everyone you. Who's left. And we'll, hopefully we'll see you next year. Is CMS going to be open next year? Probably not, right? Uh, it depends on the COVID situation mm -hmm. and also on the run situation. Of course, mm -hmm. when we are running, we close the, the detector from the visitors, but the, the service cavern can be visited. And we hope at the, the, the year end stop, we can open the visitor platform again. Yeah. But it, is, it is too far to, to make any promises. <laughs> but in any case, stay tuned. Uh, should have exciting developments. I yep. Yeah. Definitely. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Thank you.